Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. And today I'm hosting a debate, a formal debate, between inspiring philosophy and cosmic skeptic on the question of would God allow evil? Maybe a better term for that would be would God allow suffering? We'll get into that in just a moment. So th- like I mentioned, this is a formal debate. So it's it's a timed formal debate. We have 15-minute oh, openings, first rebuttals are 10 minutes, second rebuttals are five minutes, Q&A section is going to last for about 45 minutes long, and then we're going to have closings at the very end. And so the total time is going to be around two hours, but that's basically the structure of today's debate. If you like videos like this, you like the videos that I've been putting out in particular, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on the bell so you get notifications when I post new videos. If you're interested in apologetics at all, you'll probably like the other type of content that I post on my channel. So uh, just go ahead and do that while we're about to get started here. So that's the basic structure for today. If you don't know who my guests are, that's a shame. And you, here, here's the thing. Here, here's the reality is that you're probably here because you know about them. You don't necessarily know about me. But either way, let me go ahead and give a, a brief introduction of my guests here. So Cosmic Skeptic, his real name is Alex O'Connor. Cosmic Skeptic might actually also be your real name. I don't know if uh, if we want to qualify that at all. But he has 300, and I, I checked it just now. Let me actually pull it up. It was 343,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. His his YouTube channel is linked in the description. He's a uh, famous internet atheist. Is is that an inappropriate ah. title for you? <laughs> um, it's uh, it, uh, it, 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 professional professional. Dang it! It looks like we just uh, we we ran into some technical difficulties. I can see inspiring philosophy, but it looks like Alex kind of is going in and out. Oven. Yeah. Oh no. Well, let me say this because he's he'll, he'll be back. There he is. He's he's back. But he, I'm, let I'm me say back. just one more thing about him. So he's debated Frank Turek and and actually inspiring philosophy on the moral argument for God's existence. And so both of those can be found on his YouTube channel. Actually, I'm thinking about the your debate with IP. I'm not sure if that's on your channel, but either way, you can find it on mine. It so he's debated both of these guys. Frank Turek, their video is, is almost at nine hundred thousand views. I was just checking out. That's crazy. It's really cool. Yeah. So, it yeah. Congrats of, on all your nowhere. success. I think, I think quarantine period or something. Uh, it, it just more people seem to be seem to be watching it now. Yeah. I, I just cut out. My internet's being a bit funny at the moment. I hope it doesn't um, cause any problems for the for the debate. I, I'm also quite annoyed because I, I missed what sounded like maybe the beginning of you complimenting me and my channel, and I'm upset that I missed it. But hopefully you said nice things. Um, well, actually, yeah, I was kind of waiting for you to come back because of the the outage or whatever. But but yeah. Um, yeah, the, the debate with Frank Turek has, has seen a lot of popularity, um, and I've been in talks of trying to kind of speak to him again at some point and have, have another debate now that my moral worldview has shifted significantly and slightly. But you know, debates are something that I'm trying to do more of, uh, because a lot of people say that debates are, are really bad and, and they're kind of useless because they're just shouting matches and things. But I think that's got a lot to do with the way that they're conducted. If, if we can reinvigorate the spirit of uh, academic debate, but keep it actually serious, respectful, and, and um, well-informed, then I'd like to see a resurgence of the of the platform. Right, yeah, I would like to see... All these insults I had planned here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I, what I was going to say is I, I think that formal debates, like the one that we're going to do today, are not as popular, at least on YouTube, from what I've seen. And so I, I would like to start to see more of those as well, because there's different things that can happen in a formal debate as opposed to dialogue, which... I think di- most people are interested in the in the dialogue portion, but still some very interesting things can happen in a formal debate, and I think that we'll see that for sure in this one. Well, let me introduce Inspiring Philosophy real quick. So he has 146,000 subscribers, so he's not necessarily all the way to the level of Cosmic Skeptic. I don't think any of us are, but uh, maybe. Maybe one day we'll get there. And so his most viewed video series, actually, is his his series on Genesis. I think that's what you were telling me. What is it at right now? How many How many views does that series have? I don't know how many this series has, but like for example, the video on Genesis two is about three hundred thousand, and a lot of the videos have over a hundred thousand, which I was shocked by because what I'm doing is I'm just going through Genesis one to Genesis eleven and doing a commentary on each chapter and trying to explain why it doesn't necessarily teach young Earth views and what is actually in there with regards to the cultural context. But it's gotten pretty popular, and I was surprised at how big it got. Yeah, if there's one thing I am starting to learn about YouTube, it's that the videos you think you're going to do well end up not doing very well. And it's the videos that you like, you're like, okay, this video is maybe going to get like a thousand views. 
and then it gets you know five hundred thousand or however, or however many. It's like it's very difficult to predict how well a video is going to do. Well, anyways, let's get into the debate. So again, fifteen minute openings, ten minute first rebuttals, five minute second rebuttals, Q and A for forty five minutes, and then two minute closings. So we're going to start with inspiring philosophy. Hope you guys are okay with uh, with go ahead and kicking it off here. So I'm going to pull up the screen here, and I've got a timer that's going to do fifteen minutes. And again, the topic is would God allow evil? So here it is, Inspiring Philosophy, take it away. All right, well, thanks, Cameron. And uh, again, thanks for the dialogue, dialogue Alex. Uh, for the audience, last time Alex and I spoke, we had a great conversation on ethics, and I have no doubt he'll be as respectful as before. Also, I understand Alex has not made many of the arguments I'll address in my opening, but I feel it's necessary to get a well-rounded view of evil. Also, to give a quick shout out, I would like to thank uh, philosophers Trent Doherty and Justin Mooney for helping me write prepare for the debate tonight. Now, the topic is a very emotional and touchy subject, which is the evidential problem of evil. And it's very easy for any of us to get extremely passionate about instances of evil because they emotionally affect us all. But in order to derive meaning from the issue, we have to look at this logically and not rely on only our emotions. But I, I think that alone will reveals an inherent problem with the argument, because the objection is often based on emotional standards of when evil is too bad for God to allow, and not on logical parameters. If a lot of the objections, not all, but if a lot of the objections from evil appear to reduce to, well, that feels bad, and I don't think a loving God would allow that, therefore God probably doesn't exist, I have a hard time seeing how when we know there is too much evil, to say an all-loving God probably doesn't exist. You know, how are we rating this beyond appeals to emotion? Now, one of my biggest objections to the problem of evil is the objection is often stated with almost tunnel vision. What I mean is, is skeptics will often attack Christianity with evil, but they do so by not including the whole picture of Christianity. So skeptics will bring up examples like children who suffer from diseases and die young, and then say from their subjective standpoint that a good God would not allow this, but ignore that the child's consciousness would continue on in a heavenly experience. So if we're going to use evil to attack the Christian God, one must do so by looking at the whole picture of the Christian worldview. So I'll present six aspects of Christianity that put evil in perspective and argue for compatibility. Number one is the afterlife. The truth is we cannot judge Christianity without the acknowledgement of the afterlife, meaning that the suffering of this life is only temporary and will pale in comparison to eternity. An analogy can be drawn from your childhood as compared to your current adult life. And I realize analogies are not perfect. But think of the limited knowledge you had as a child and the things that used to cause you suffering. I remember crying over lost toys, which I've now forgotten about. On a more serious note, my mother suffered from serious depression when I was a young kid. And as a result, I suffered from severe verbal and physical abuse. Now, thankfully, she got the help she needed and is healthy now. And I can't say I suffer from any long-term effects. However, in those moments, moments decades ago, it felt like my world was ending and I would never recover. Most of the suffering we had as children pales in comparison to the lives we live now. Other than traumatic cases, and again, I understand analogies are not perfect, but most of the suffering we experienced as children had no long-lasting effects, even though in those moments it felt excruciating. Analogously, the present suffering of this life will be outdone by eternity with God. So the argument is simply that the suffering in the present life will be swallowed up by the joy of heaven and will have no lasting effects when compared to eternity. Evidence in near-death experiences seems to support this. Reports from people who have been revived report that the next life is more real than real. This world feels more like a dream when compared to what is to come. Now, I've had some dreams where horrible things have happened, and then I wake up and the pain does not last. In fact, I can't even remember most of my nightmares. If upon death we wake up to a more real existence, which makes this life feel like a dream, it can hardly be said the suffering of this life will have any real lasting damage. Now, some might bring up the existence of hell, and I cover this more extensively in my video, Does God Send People to Hell? Uh, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, the doors of hell are locked from the inside, and the only people in hell are the people who want to be there. So for more, see that video. The second problem builds on the first, and it is to argue we cannot ignore the ontological differences between humans and God. As John Hick and Eric Reeton have argued, we are called to stop evil when we're able to, but the circumstances change for an omnipotent, omniscient being. Where if such a being would have the same requirements as us, it would result in some sort of dystopian police state, where there's no human dignity or freedom because God just controls everything. It seems God might be obligated to allow freedom and indirectly evil to prevent a worse state of affairs. Also, many argue it's unfair for God to allow people to die from diseases or natural disasters 
But from God's perspective, no one died per se. When, you, when a human kills someone, they remove that person from their plane of existence for selfish or hateful reasons. Since God is on all planes of existence, it's logically impossible for him to murder someone the way a human might. Instead, he is just moving people from one plane of existence to another. So we should think of the suffering in this life from God's perspective, analogous to how this happens in a dream world in the movie Inception. So when you kill someone in a dream world, you're not ending their life, but moving them from one plane of existence to another. If someone is suffering in a dream, it's not that big of a deal, because you know they will wake up, the pain will be a fading memory as something less than real. Likewise, it's not necessarily immoral for God to end a life or allow suffering, because our current suffering is more dreamlike than real from God's perspective. It may not be as bad as we emotionally feel in the moment. Third, one also needs to account for the fall of humanity. The current state of affairs was the result of humans electing to rule themselves instead of living under God. God desired for humans to live with him in an Eden setting, and we elected not to and continue to elect that every day we don't love our neighbor as ourselves. Some have argued they were not born into this world and didn't have the same choice as Adam or Eve did. Clay Jones responds to this by saying, that we didn't individually vote to make Adam the head of our race doesn't matter, because God knows who can best represent us. Also, if God knew that all of us would have acted similarly, he does no wrong in choosing one person to represent us. So the current world was not what God wanted, but he's allowing us to experience it in this dreamlike setting so that we can see the consequences of our actions and fully see what we're rejecting his lordship is like. Fourth, the most popular response to the problem of evil is to note the free will of humans seems to be the biggest cause of evil. Humans caused the Holocaust without God. Humans executed the rape of Nan King without God. If people actually did what Jesus called us to do, a lot of the suffering in this life would be eliminated. The truth is humanity, all of us together, have created a world of suffering and evil. Some have argued God allows too much freedom and therefore too much evil. But again, let's remember from God's perspective, the present suffering of this life will pale in comparison to eternity, and this world is more dreamlike. He also has more wisdom on how uh, much suffering will and can affect each individual as well as how to overcome these wounds in eternity. Also, again, the basis for this seems to be an emotional standard rather than a logical one. The truth is that it's hard for any of us to know when the right amount of evil, or, or where the right amount of evil is, or when evil is objectively set to be too much for a loving God to exist. If God is going to create free creatures, but then limit how far they can go from his will, then there really is no freedom because we're set in some sort of giant cosmic playpen, where we don't know what life without God would really entail, because God would not allow us to experience it in this life. If this, if that was the case, we would never truly see the real consequences of our rebellion. Instead, we'd have God as some sort of over, overbearing mother who's supposed to take care of us when it is needed, but doesn't really let us learn the horrendous consequences of what happens when we abandon him and choose to live in a natural world without his presence. The point is, unless we see the evil in our, what, our, what the evil in our hearts truly does to ourselves and our fellow humans, we will never learn and so God's message is simply that our rebellion must be fully realized so that hopefully we will return to him. Fifth, suffering itself is not necessarily evil. It's often logically assumed uh, or it's often logically assumed that suffering is entirely evil or bad, but there's an epistemic gap between the two. As Richard Swinburne says, pains and other sufferings are bad state of affairs, but it is odd to call them evil. When, for example, when I work out, I experience suffering, but we would say this is healthy and therefore instrumentally good. Raising my daughter, I have to allow suffering so she doesn't become spoiled. When I tell her no to things, like when she asked if she can play on the roof, true story, she cried and she experienced suffering. But such discipline is actually instrumentally good for her. Giving a homeless man a dollar might seem good, but studies show it actually just enables their addictions and keeps them on the streets. It's actually better for them to seek real help from a shelter which can create suffering, but going through these hard processes are instrumentally good. Likewise, allowing, allowing suffering in this life might actually be useful in soul building and allowing us to mature into more enlightened individuals. I also want to point out uh, for this discussion, I want to save this more for, the, for later, but philosophers Justin Moody and Trent Doherty have pointed out a lot of the arguments from evil and suffering presuppose a consequentialist view of good. That God is obligated to bring about a result that reduces overall suffering and increased pleasure. But if deontology or virtue ethics is the correct theory of moral rightness, then God may have other goals or internal obligations that must be achieved in order for him to be the good. 
In other words, it's possible it would not be right for God to remove significant human freedom, even though that indirectly creates suffering. As long as what is good is not defined in terms of consequences, namely increasing pleasure, but actions. So we have to make sure we're not presupposing a consequentialist view of right and wrong, as that might not be the case, but we can talk more about that later. In terms of examples of natural evils, like earthquakes or diseases, I don't think natural evil is the best way to describe these things, because an earthquake on Mars is not evil. Smallpox being studied in a lab is not evil. These things are better described as examples of chaos causing suffering, which would have been absent in Eden, which we rejected. We're experiencing a disordered world, which has indirect horrible consequences. Finally, any attack regarding any uh, attack from the existence of evil uh, cannot ignore the suffering of Christ. Now, I know this is a bit of an emotional argument, but since the sting of evil is more emotional than logical, it makes sense that God's answer to evil should be to heal our emotional wounds as well. So the Christian answer to a world filled with torture and murder is a God who was tortured and murdered. Atheist Albert Camus admitted, Christ the God-man suffers too. Evil and death can no longer be entirely imputed to him since he suffers and dies. The night on Golgotha is so important because the divinity ostensibly abandoned its traditional privilege and lived through to the end, despair included, in the agony of death. Jesus has also united to the present suffering of his people. When, when he appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus said in Matthew 25, when we feed and clothe the helpless, we're doing it to him. And if we reject these people, we're rejecting him. 1 Corinthians 6 says we're united to the Lord in one spirit. The implication from the Bible is when we suffer, God experiences the suffering as well. He doesn't have to, but he's plunged himself into our reality and feels the pain that we do. As Timothy Keller pointed out, since God got off his throne and plunged himself into evil and suffering with us, the reason he allows suffering cannot be because he doesn't love us. So given Keller's point, we have evidence that God is good despite the evil in this world. So in summary, Christianity answers evil by reminding us of the, af the afterlife will turn all our misfortunes into joy. God is ontologically different than us and therefore has different obligations. Uh, there was a fall that humanity elected. Most of the evil in this life comes from human freedom. Suffering can be allowed for instrumental good in soul building or creating more virtuous individuals. Uh, suffering is not – or good is not necessarily defined in terms of consequences or outcomes, and God has chosen to allow evil to affect him as well. Now finally, even if I am wrong, the existence of evil cannot debunk the Christian God or Christian theism. All it can really do is show a world where moral realism is true meaning objective moral values and duties exist, and Christianity is true, cannot both cannot both be true. Since evil is a separate issue than the evidence for Christianity, if my argument from e if the argument from evil was successful, it would just show Christianity could still be true on its own evidence, and that there's no objective standard of good and evil. What I mean is sometimes I encounter Christians who believe right and wrong is just arbitrarily set by God. And they tell me if God made it so that it was okay to murder and steal, then it would be. In reality, they are Christians and moral relatives, moral relativists, who believe that morality is just arbitrarily set by God and has no objective basis. Now, I don't personally believe this, but this entails Christianity and moral subjectivism are technically compatible. Now, I've always found it odd that many non-theists who attack Christianity from evil are themselves moral subjectivists, meaning, that, meaning they don't think there is an objective standard of right and wrong. So the Christian theist could always get out, get out of the argument of evil, the argument from evil. By just denying the existence of objective right and wrong. Some Christians are in fact moral subjectivists, advocating relativistic forms of divine command theory. And notice the more the atheist pressures such Christians about the, object, the object, objectivity of moral value, the more pressure there is on the atheists to explain where objective morality comes from. This might, this might prove quite counterproductive for the atheists in the long run. So the argument from evil is really unsuccessful in its ultimate goal. Now, there's a lot more I want to say on this, but I don't have the time in my opening statement, including something I'm theorizing I'm calling the law of triumph, which would act like a natural law. I said act, not is a natural law, but would act like a natural law and would be imbued in reality and would always guarantee evil would be outshined by good or is always defeated when it arises. But I can talk more about that later. I'd also like to say I, I'm really glad to be having this conversation with Alex because I feel like uh, he's not here to score points but actually have a dialogue. And I feel like he's one of the, the best debate opponents uh, for this conversation to have with. So I, I appreciate the conversation, and I look forward to hearing what Alex has to say. All right, so it looks like we've got about 40 seconds left. So let's pass it over to, to Alex.
And I'm going to start my timer here, another 15 minutes for your opening statement. And whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Uh, sure thing. Yeah, when, when, whenever's good. Uh, let's do it. I, I think uh, it's worth noting that I'm making an opening statement here, so I'm not going to directly respond to everything that Michael has just said, although some of them, some of those things will come up and we'll, and we'll, and we'll see how it goes. Um, essentially, I, I want to make the case that, you know, that I used to think that the problem of evil was a bad argument on logical grounds because of the fact that there's always logical space for there to be morally sufficient reason for God to allow suffering. You can always say that that it's it, it can't be logically ruled out that there's some reason why God would allow the suffering in the world. Um, I've since changed my mind on this view and, and become more attracted to the evidential problem than the logical problem of evil. Um, as people grow up, as myself, as, as I've grown, um, I become personally acquainted with levels and, and kinds of suffering that seem to demand a fuller explanation than, well, it's not logically impossible that God uh, would allow this, right? In that capacity, I'm not so much arguing that the presence of suffering should give us reason to think that a loving God cannot exist. Um, I'm arguing that there's, I'm, I'm not arguing that there's no possible world in which God exists and also evil exists. I prefer to make an evidential case that the sheer level and depth of suffering that exists in the actual world should at least give us major pause. I can't argue that it's impossible that God should allow such suffering, but I can suggest that it appears extremely unlikely. If somebody murdered a close friend of mine in cold blood and stole his wallet right in front of me, I couldn't logically rule out the possibility that my friend was some undercover political saboteur whose assassination prevented him from committing a war crime against the United Kingdom, and there was national security secrets in his wallet, and so the assassin actually did a good thing. Uh, Sure, that's not logically impossible. I can't rule that out. But not only would it be difficult to entertain this hypothesis as I watch my friend bleeding out on the floor, I'd also be somewhat troubled by anyone who tried to argue that it might be a good thing that my friend was murdered because of this reason. And that if I want to mourn his sadness, if, if I want to mourn him in sadness, if I want to say that's a bad thing, then I'd better be able to demonstrate that his death is logically incompatible with the theory of a benevolent assassin. I don't think that that would be my burden in that situation. Um, but do bear in mind that I'm using this as an analogy to describe why I bring up, uh, why, why when you bring up the problem of evil, it's not necessarily a claim of logical inconsistency, um, but simply to observe that we have some reason to doubt the intentions or existence of an ostensibly loving God. Right? I, I'm not particularly as interested in these cases of seeming moral evil, um, that is, evil that results from human action, although this does require a level of discussion, and, and it's probably going to be the focal point of our discussion, but the reason why I'm more interested in discuss, discussing the problem of suffering rather than the pro problem of evil, per se, is that, um, as Michael points out, many people think it's problematic for an atheist to talk about evil. Um, we can also say that if evil requires evil intention, and we can't know the intentions of someone like God, it becomes difficult to use terms like evil. However, both Christians and atheists can both agree that suffering definitely exists. Uh, and if suffering does exist, the point is this. Any religion which purports the existence of a loving God must demonstrate why the suffering in the world is justified. Now, the problem is most difficult, I believe, not on the subject of moral evil, but so-called natural evil. That is, evil not caused uh, by free human choice, but rather by earthly events generally referred to, quite unfortunately, perhaps for Michael, as acts of God. Uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, natural diseases, these kinds of things. The difficulty for the Christian in cases of such evil is not so much to say that it's justified, but, as Michael kind of implied, to say that this isn't evil at all, because it results from the natural order which God controls, not human action, and therefore must be justifiably inflicted, making it not a demonstration of evil at all, but instead a demonstration of justice or of necessity. And this is what I'd really like to hear from Michael, not an explanation as to how free will is necessary and as a result of this humans inflict holocaust, but that when a mother is ripped from her child by a tsunami, this is not something to be thought of as bad, but something to be worth celebrating as an act of justice or a kind of suffering without which God could not conduct his plans properly. Still, it's worth considering the logical problem of evil and the issue of moral evil. It, you, you need to note that in order to hold that suffering is compatible with God, with a God who is morally perfect, you must hold the belief that this suffering is somehow necessary to obtain uh, the optimal end. Right. Most commonly, this view is put forward by talking about human free will. If humans are to be what they're supposed to be, free agents capable of freely choosing whether or not they love God, then they must be granted free will. This is a case that uh, Michael makes in his hour-long video on the problem of evil. Um, in order to do what's good, 
a person must have the capacity to do what's bad, the capability to do what's bad, and elect to do the opposite. If they're incapable of committing evil, they're essentially compelled to commit good, and committing a good action because you have no other choice to is not really committing a good action at all, but a robotic gesture of compulsion. This is a logical point. The absence of moral evil is incompatible with free will. And to answer this point, I have a question, which is which I've raised in a video before. Is there free will in heaven? Heaven is a place devoid of suffering, where nobody's killing anyone, no one's torturing anyone, no holocausts or wars are taking place. Yet presumably, unless heaven is the kind of robotic, um, compelled nature condemned by Michael, there must also be free will. If this is the case, then here we have an example of humans existing with free will, and yet there being no evil. Michael may wish to respond to this by saying that those in heaven still have a capacity for, for evil, but the very reason they're in heaven is because they're the kind of person who refuses to act upon it. But in order to hold this view, some things must be assumed. Firstly, that it's possible that evil can exist in heaven and can be committed in heaven. That is, though in practice nobody commits it, there is no, there's nothing logically preventing a holocaust from taking place in heaven. Now, you may just bite the bullet on this point um, and say, yeah, it's no problem because it's not going to happen in practice. But this is difficult for me to believe that there's nothing logically preventing a Nazi holocaust reoccurring in heaven. Uh, a possible escape to this might be to suggest that the people in heaven are so good, and the reason they're in heaven is because they're so good, that it's psychologically impossible for them, essentially, to commit evil. But there are two problems with this. First, if it's really impossible for them to commit evil, then on Michael's own account, it's also impossible for them to be good, since to be good requires the capacity to be evil. If this is denied and it's asserted that it can be psychologically impossible for some people to commit evil and yet then still being a free being in, a, in the relevant sense, uh, then uh, what we have essentially uh, is proof uh, is, yeah, we have proof that God is capable of producing humans who somehow have free will and yet are still incapable of committing evil, even if just as a matter of psychological impossibility. If that can obtain logically in heaven, it can obtain logically on earth too. If the reason being given for the necessity of evil is that human free will requires it, but God is capable of producing human beings with free will who are yet incapable of committing evil, the free will defense collapses. Of course, there are many other arguments of the necessity of evil that are put forward. Uh, one, one of the most popular I always hear, is the higher goods argument. And Michael actually made this argument in his opening statement, talking about an instrumental good, like going to the gym. You know, if, if you go to the gym, sure, you suffer, but it's instrumentally good because there's a higher good of, of health or something like that, which can be obtained by that suffering. In other words, the existence of some goods worth having necessitate the existence of some evils. For example, we can't have bravery without the existence of fear. In order for a soldier to demonstrate bravery by jumping on a grenade to save his comrades, a grenade needs to be thrown, right? If no such evils are ever committed, no such higher order goods can ever exist, and where would we be without things like bravery? But I submit the following. Bravery is only good in the first place by virtue of our need to overcome something bad. I'd rather have no fear and no need for bravery. If a soldier jumps on a grenade, we can congratulate him for his bravery, but we would be out of our minds to thank the person who threw the grenade and be grateful that it blew him up, since without that grenade, the bravery would never have manifested. And yet a Christian who uses this defense is thankful to God for throwing the grenade of suffering into the world because it allows us to develop means of overcoming that suffering, such as bravery. The logic is the same as being thankful for the existence of cancer because it allows us to develop these wonderful medical advancements like chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Without the suffering, we wouldn't have these wonderful medical advancements. But if the medical treatment is only good in virtue of it being needed to overcome cancer, we'd rather have no cancer and no chemotherapy. And if bravery is only useful or admirable insofar as it allows us to overcome fear, then we should rather have no fear and no bravery. A higher order good only justifies the lower order evil if the higher order good isn't only good because of the existence of the evil. To use Michael's own example, nobody would go to the gym and experience the pain of working out unless it was actually needed to achieve their health and their dream body, right? The higher order goods, if they could be obtained without needing to go through the suffering, that would be chosen. And so we should have reason to believe that God would choose the same for us.
Um, but also the Christian must contend with the idea that if evil is somehow necessary, whichever account of necessity you give, we must have exactly the right amount of evil in the world. And this is something Michael um, seems to have implied in his opening statement. This is the most difficult thing for me to accept. If a loving God may need to allow suffering for reasons of free will, higher order goods or personal development or whatever it may be, this God would still not allow gratuitous suffering. It wouldn't allow more suffering than is necessary, because then that suffering wouldn't be necessary for good to prevail, and therefore would be unjustified. But it must also be accepted that therefore God couldn't have allowed any less suffering to exist, because this would imply that not all of the evil in the world is in fact necessary, and that therefore God does allow specifically unnecessary suffering, which is incompatible, uh, incompatible with an omnipotent loving God. We have to believe in something of a best of all possible worlds approach, that exactly the correct amount of evil exists in the world. Any more, and God would be allowing unnecessary suffering. Any less, and God would be unable to procure whatever goodness is necessitated by that suffering. Michael, in his video of, on, on the problem of evil that I've already mentioned, considers this problem, asking why, for example, uh, when the Nazis rounded up Jews to be shot, why couldn't God just have made the guns jam, right? The Nazis could still freely pull the trigger, but the Jews didn't need to die. Now, Michael responds to this by quoting C.S. Lewis, who argues that in a world in which God always intervenes to stop every instance of moral evil, this wouldn't be a, a world of free will, because it would make bad actions impossible to perform. If every time someone tried to commit evil, God intervened, it would simply render people incapable of being evil, uh, which means that they don't actually have free will. But this conflates two questions. When I watched this video, this is what I thought. Michael makes a case as to why God can't intervene in every case of moral evil. But the question was actually, why doesn't God, or why won't God, intervene in this case of moral evil? Of course, if God jammed the, uh, if God jammed the guns, the Nazis would stop shooting, right? They wouldn't be able to commit the evil of act of pulling the trigger because they'd know that it wouldn't achieve the, the end that they desire. But that wouldn't stop God preventing one case of moral evil, such as that the Nazis, um, such that the Nazis still had the pro uh, still had the, the freedom to pull the trigger, uh, and giving them no reason to think that they'll always be prevented. They'd still feel and have the freedom to pull the trigger and commit that evil act, uh, but the the people still could have been spared. Now, an obvious response to this is, how do we know that this isn't already the case? Um, uh, yeah, how, how do we know that God has not already prevented the maximal number of, of uh, cases of moral evil that he can? This is what Michael asked in the opening statement. You know, like, how are we going to know where to draw the line? Perhaps when Viktor Frankl was filing into Auschwitz and the SS soldier pointed to the right instead of the left, saving him from an immediate gassing, that was God's doing. But had he jammed one more gun or caused one more gas chamber to, to malfunction, that would have been too much, right? But this is the implication. When Wilfred Owen describes the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs of his fellow soldier, drowning in a sea of green gas, and when Viktor Frankl describes the popularity of running into electric gates of concentration camps as a suicide method, common enough to be colloquially known simply as running into the wire, the best of all possible worlds approach asks us to accept that had that specific friend of Owen's soldier been spared his fate on cho of choking on poisoned air, and had his death been even remotely less painful, less torturous, less prolonged, that the world would be a worse place for it. Somehow, exactly that amount of suffering is necessitated in order for the general good to obtain, for free will to exist, for heaven to be an option, for higher order goods, for personal development. This must be the maximal state of affairs. 1.31 million Jews were killed during the first three months of the Holocaust. Are we expected to believe that this is the perfect number? 1.32 million Jews would have been an unjustifiable evil because this was more than strictly necessary. 1.29 million wouldn't have been quite enough and the world would be a worse place if those 30,000 extra people were saved. No, allowing 1.32 million Jews exactly to die is the Goldilocks number that is necessitated for good to obtain. If the fact that this is moral evil that I'm talking about, um, not natural evil, is a problem to you, then just ask a different question. Is it really the case that if a mother had five extra seconds with her child before that child was ripped away from her by that tsunami, the world would be a worse place for it, or would somehow not be able to obtain as much good? If such a ludicrous, in my view, position even requires a response, um, as if it requires such a response, I think this can best be answered somewhat in, in a literary sense by referring to what uh, Voltaire has one of his characters say in Candide, quite famously, 
that if this is all the po- if this is the best of all possible worlds, then what on earth must the others be like? Now, I don't have in 10 seconds the time to also bring up the problem of animal suffering and not just the suffering that we inflict upon them, but the suffering they, uh, that, that falls on them in the wild. But that's something I'd also like to talk about in a, in a future section coming up. Um, but there's a lot on the table and I'm looking forward to engaging on, this, uh, on, on, this, on these topics. Okay, thank you for that, Alex. We're going to go back to inspiring philosophy. Let me go ahead and get my 10-minute countdown here. So we just did 15-minute openings. We have 10-minute first rebuttals. And Michael, whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start the countdown. All right. All right. Thank you for that, Alex. I appreciate a lot of the, uh, the criticisms there and the feedback. I want to start by talking about heaven really quickly and then moving on to the more general conversation. Uh, yes, I do believe there is free will in heaven, and I do think there is suffering in heaven. The Bible says there was a war in heaven. We know anything about wars. They're horrible. It creates a ma- immense amount of suffering. So, yes, I fully do agree there can be suffering in wars in heaven. Second of all, Christian heaven is not just going to a place beyond this earth. It's about life after, life after death. It's about a return to this earth and the resurrection, where we'll be reigning. Who are we going to be reigning over? Well, uh, if you read some of the scriptures, I would say, based on passages like Roman 8, it's all the animals. So I do think there can be continual suffering in there, and it's going to be our job to sort of make the universe into something far better. So no, I don't think that really creates issues. And I do want to get to animal suffering, so hopefully we can come back around to that. Um, and I'll bring up some work by Trent Doherty and Josh Rasmussen. So I want to talk about uh, one of the things you said regarding, I'd rather have no bravery than fear. Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting point to bring up, and it seems to be, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but you're sort of saying like it would be far better to not even have these uh, elements of suffering uh, versus the good that sort of comes from them. And this is where I would like to talk about something I've been working on. I'm calling the law of triumph, which I'll basically define as if or when suffering arises, it can always ultimately be overcome by good, that will be intrinsically more valuable and worthwhile than the intrinsic bad badness of the initial suffering. In other words, God has created a world where if suffering happens, it can always be outweighed by good. Now, I don't want people to think this is a trivial point, because it might, might sound trivial at first, but think of the Lord of the Rings, for example. Let's just say that in that world, Aru, Aru Eli Vitar didn't create any suffering. This may sound trivial, but would anyone want to read that book? I think the answer is no, it would sound quite boring. And I think the reason for that is we recognize there is some sort of intrinsic goodness in the triumph of that story, of people overcoming the badness, that the triumph basically outshines any sort of suffering and puts it in a far better perspective that creates far better virtuous creatures than if it was a world just devoid of any sort of suffering. So you would also say that God has put in place something like a law of nature, which causes virtuous good to emerge from any from evil that can occur. Another way of thinking about it is that God, when creating this world, it issues a bunch of conditional decrees to the effect that if such and such evil happens, such and such greater good will result or ultimately outshine it in that sense. Uh, uh, St. Augustine said it like this, since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such to bring about, bring good even out of the evil. So the basic point is that I want to also circle back around to God's obligations. I think you and I might disagree on this point, but I would think it would be better if a world exists where there are virtuous people in suffering versus a world of no virtuous people and there's just pure pleasure or no suffering. And I think that uh, I think the reason is is because I think we acknowledge the existence of the fact that uh, this world of lacking of pleasure or this world that only has pleasure and doesn't have suffering is far less intrinsically good than a world that does employ suffering to create far better, uh, intri- far better interesting, far better uh, acts of triumph in, vir- in creating virtuous creatures in that sense. So uh, Trent Do- uh, Doherty talks about this in his book on animal suffering, that the point of what God is doing here is to build souls, and he includes animals in this as well, that animals are also soul-building things. And so what he basically points out is that God is basically saying, I'm not going to intervene in this suffering, terrible though as it is, because I know you can make it through it, and I want you to have experiential knowledge of this fact as well. So no, I don't think God is directly causing the suffering. I think God has sort of created a universe to create more mature soul-building things. And he has sort of imbued this sort of law of triumph in it, that if suffering does arise, it can be defeated, and it will ultimately turn out to be more instrumentally good in creating more uh, more virtuous souls, better souls in the long run. Uh, 
So the essence of the soul building as theodicy is that we find the kind of evil and suffering in the world that is precisely the kind of evil and suffering that will lead to souls of great character or multidimensional persons of great virtue. So uh, in response to this idea about natural evil, um, I don't think God is sort of like creating these natural evils to sort of like get the right amount of suffering in there. I don't think that's necessary. I'm not even sure if there is a best possible world, and I would uh, challenge that kind of idea. So if I'm just going to – let me just quote John Hick here. Suppose contrary to the fact that this world were a paradise from which all possibility of pain and suffering were excluded. The consequences would be very far-reaching. For example, no one could ever injure anyone else. The murderer's knife would turn to paper or his bullets to thin air. The bank safe, the ro uh, robbed of millions of dollars, would miraculously become filled with another million dollars. Uh, without this, without this device or however on large scale providing inflationary problems. So again, no one would ever be injured by accident. The mountain climber uh, or, playing, or a playing child fall from a height would float unarmed to the ground. The reckless driver would never meet his disaster. There'd be no need to work, since no harm would come from avoiding work. There'd be no need to call to call there would be no need to call to be concerned for others in times of need of danger. For such a world there could be no real needs or dangers. To make possible this continual series of individual adjustments, nature would have to work by special providences. Instead of running accord to general laws, then men must learn to respect on penalty of pain or death. The laws of nature would have to be extremely flexible. Sometimes gravity would operate, sometimes not. Sometimes an object would be hard or solid, sometimes salt. There could be no real sciences, for there would be no enduring world structure to investigate. In eliminating the problems and hardships of an, obje of an objective environment uh, with its own laws, life would become like a dream in which a delightfulness, but aimlessly, would float and drift at ease. One could at least begin to imagine such a world. It is evident that our present ethical con concepts would have no meaning in, in it. If, for example, the notion of harming someone is an essential element in the concept of a wrong ac action, in our hedonistic paradise there could be no wrong actions, nor any right actions and distinctions from wrong. Courage, and, uh, courage would have no point in an environment in which there is, by definition, no danger or difficulty. Generosity or kindness or the agape aspect of love, prudence, unselfishness, and other ethical notions which presuppose life in an objective environment could not even be formed. Consequently, such a world, however well it might promote pleasure, would be very ill-adapt Ill for the development of moral qualities of human personalities. In relation to this purpose, it might be the worst of all possible worlds. So his basically point is that if you're going to have this kind of world, you're not developing virtuous individuals. Now, I'm not saying that God is causing the suffering to get there. I think, building on Josh Rasmussen, that God has created a world with two things, randomness and free creatures. Now, God being omnipotent, uh, I think this is a far more better way to build souls because he's not directly determining certain things. He's allowing souls to develop through a random, uh, a universe imbued with randomness, uh, have their own freedom to guide their own paths. That is going to create far more interesting souls in the long run, including animal souls as well. Uh, and with that and said, I also would say that God has imbued this idea of a law of triumph in there. So if they encounter suffering, that suffering can ultimately be overdone and ultimately destroyed in the long run. I, again, go back to my own childhood. I suffered immense suffering as a young child. It was horrible. But I honestly can't say it does affect me in any serious way. The only reason I thought about it was I was just thinking of good analogies, and that came into my head. Most of the time, I simply forget about it because I think the good of life outweighs the suffering that we can experience. And let me give another analogy. I think you and I would both agree we ought to save and preserve the rainforest. We, don't, we should not want the rainforest to go away. But the rainforest, there's immense animal suffering in the rainforest. Why should we not want to end the rainforest for the extent that it would prevent it would prevent millions of generations from suffering of those animals? Why not just clear it all, establish a bunch of farming to feed a growing vegan population? Well, I think we recognize the life of the rainforest, the aesthetic beauty of the rainforest, is far more intrinsically better than the suffering at part of that. And so I don't think suffering will ever out, uh, outshine the good, the intrinsic goodness of life. And I think God has imbued a laws within his reality that can use suffering for good. Now, I don't think necessarily all the suffering has to be used for good. I'm not going to deny, uh, I'm going to build on someone like Kirk McGregor, Trent Torty, that we don't have to say all suffering is useful or has to be there so God can build souls. We simply are pointing out that if there is suffering, it can be overcome, that it is part of uh, God's reality in sort of like helping to build souls, but it's not. It, we're not saying that it is um, 
we're not saying that it has that it always has to be useful in that sense and that god has to sort of determine everything in that sort of direction only that if god is going to create a universe which free creatures are going to experience soul building they would have to have freedom in order to do it to sort of build virtuous qualities and in that sense that uh, no matter what comes up the good will always outshine or always outweigh it it also has to do with god's obligations is his obligations to create a world of pleasure or is his obligations to create a world of virtuous creatures and i think given the, the data i think given what is more intrinsically better i think triumph with suffering is far more intrinsically better than a world without suffering and just pleasure all right let's pass it over back to uh, to alex here and let me set my timer for 10 minutes and just as a reminder we have uh Alex's first rebuttal is 10 minutes long. We're going to do a second round of rebuttals. Those will f those are five minutes long, and then we're going to do some Q&A. So I noticed that a few people have already sent in some Super Chats, and we're going to get to those. And if you can, we're not going to do every Super Chat because I think some of them were, were just comments. But if you have a question for either de debater, then make sure to address who, who the question is addressed to. And then if you ask it as a Super Chat, then that's a very easy way for me to go back and, and be able to pull it up. Uh, and we'll make sure that we get to those. So... Here you go, Alex. You got 10 minutes for your first rebuttal. And whenever you're you're ready, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Amazing. Thanks. Uh, there's a lot to respond to there, of course. Lots of individual points being brought up. And I'll try to just go through as many as I can. Um, I tried to kind of just make a note of the general points. So maybe I'll misrepresent some here. Uh, hopefully not. Um, I'm trying to choose which ones are, are best to go through with the time remaining. Maybe I'll take some in reverse so that they're fresher in the memory of the audience um some of the arguments i found quite bizarre for instance they argue about the rainforest you say you know we'd rather keep the rainforest uh, despite the fact that it's uh harmful to life on earth because of something like its aesthetic beauty i would absolutely reject that out of hand um the reason why i think it's worth keeping the rainforest is because if we get rid of the rainforest it will cause ecological disaster that will cause more animals to suffer than if we kept it if that weren't the case if it were really the case that if we just got if we just tore down the rainforest, it wouldn't produce more evil, wouldn't produce more suffering, more ecological disaster. Um, but the only downside was that we wouldn't have something like the aesthetic beauty of the of the forest. Then I would be on the first plane over there chopping it down with an axe. I wouldn't allow the rainforest to stay up because of its aesthetic beauty if it meant that billions of human beings were dying and suffering as a result. And so I'm certainly not going to allow a rainforest to stay up just for the sake of its aesthetic beauty uh, because a bunch of animals are dying as a result. Um, I absolutely don't think that it has any intrinsic worth outside of the effect that it has uh, on suffering, except for maybe a minimal worth with things like aesthetic beauty, which are nowhere near as important as the suffering that it's inflicting. Um, and besides, I've never seen the rainforest in person uh, and, and so kind of I, I doubt how much the aesthetic beauty of the rainforest or something like that actually should play into a consideration like that. Um, you asked about uh, my concept of kind of preferring no bravery and no fear. And you brought up an example from Lord of the Rings. Now, as an Oxonian, it's quite embarrassing to admit that I've never read nor seen the Lord of the Rings. But it was similar to another example uh, that was that was brought up by Vince Vital on an episode of Unbelievable, um, which is one of my favorite radio shows to listen to, uh, there was a debate about the problem of evil, and Vince Vitale brought up a really interesting point that, that stumped me for a minute. He said, th think of all of your inspirations, think of the heroes of your time. So you're thinking of the, the Martin Luther Kings of the world, and you think, take whichever hero you, know, you, you personally admire. Now remove the suffering from their life. Take that suffering away, and what are they left with? They're, not, they're no longer a hero. You know, if, if Martin Luther King never suffered, then he wouldn't have overcome that suffering. He wouldn't have become the forefront of the civil rights movement. He wouldn't have been a hero. And so the very thing that made him admirable is the fact that he's suffering. And this is kind of the point that I, it seems you were, you were implicitly making that it's worth having this kind of suffering so that a world of virtue can exist. But I think we're conflating two topics here. And I, I don't know how well I'll be able to tease these apart. But what we're talking about when it comes to the problem of evil is why it's kind of the existence of suffering versus the existence of pleasure, not the existence of, of virtue. I mean, if you say something like, without evil, virtuous lives wouldn't exist, okay, fine, but that's not strictly a problem for the argument that I'm making, because I'm trying to argue a case that there could be a world in which people are, uh, you know, experiencing less suffering, experiencing more pleasure, that is. 
sure, there might be no virtue, but that's not a problem if it still results in more pleasure. The only way to kind of make it relevant is to say that virtue is a good in and of itself. But that to me is, is obviously false. Virtue, a virtue like Martin Luther King overcoming racism is only good insofar as we have the evil of racism to be overcome. Without the evil of racism, why is it that Martin Luther King wouldn't be a virtuous hero? Because his actions would have been meaningless. Like it, it, the, virtue, it, the, the virtue of what he did isn't good of its own accord. It's only good by virtue um, of an evil. So yeah, I think I really would prefer that there was no racism, even if that meant that Martin Luther King would no longer be a hero of mine, even if that meant that he was no longer able to demonstrate virtue. I'd rather a world in which he didn't have to demonstrate virtue in order to overcome the evils of racism. And I hope that makes sense. Um, you also talked about science. You, you kind of gave that as a, as a more uh, detached, kind of less morally wrapped up example, because, you know, talking about Martin Luther King and racism, especially right now, goodness, I didn't even think, um, might be, as you say, emotionally distracting. But take the issue of science. You say, look, science wouldn't exist in, in a perfect world in which kind of there was no ignorance. Um, but again, the same point can be made that science is only good or useful insofar as we are ignorant, right? The argument is kind of that without ignorance, we wouldn't have the good of science. So we, it, it's justifiable that we have the badness of, of, uh, of ignorance because it allows this higher order good of science to exist. Um, but what is the goal of science? The goal of science is to remove ignorance. That's what science tries to do on a daily basis. Now, why would it be the case that the goal of science is to undermine the very reason for its existence? Why would it be that the goal of science is to remove ignorance if it's known that science, the good of science only exists because of ignorance? Because we recognize that we'd rather have no ignorance and no science. Okay, the goal of science is to no longer need science. In the same way that some political philosophies like um, uh, something like Marxism would likely say that the goal of Marxism is for Marxism to no longer be necessary, right? Um, the reason I choose that example is because it kind of has an end goal in mind um, as opposed to like a capitalist ideology. But you see what I'm saying? Like somebody in the same way that I'm, I'm a vegan advocate and the goal of veganism is for veganism to no longer be a, a thing, right? Like, yeah, sure, I've got this this good thing that I can do advocating for veganism. But I'd rather a world in which I didn't have that good. I didn't have that virtue. Right? The whole thing that I'm aiming for is a world in which the very reason for me being a vegan activist doesn't exist. I don't think that the evil of the animal agricultural industry is worth the virtue of somebody fighting against it. I'd rather have neither. The virtue is only good by virtue of the evil existing. And so, yeah, I really would rather have neither. Um, and I think that kind of making a point about how, but we wouldn't have virtue, um, we wouldn't have triumph in a world without evil it's like intuitively we want to think yeah no that sounds bad you know it, it would be bad to have a world without triumph and, vir and virtue but if you if you think about it for a moment and recognize that the only reason virtue and triumph are good is because there's evil if you remove that evil triumph and virtue are no longer good and therefore no longer desirable so it's not a problem that we don't have them either um also, there was a, a reference you made to Augustine. Um, I'm kind of picking these out of thin air because I, I had to kind of make notes. I'm, I'm less used to the, the formal environment. Um, the, the, the reference you made to Augustine and the point that kind of preceded it, that God in his omnipotence and omnibenevolence wouldn't allow evil unless it was justified. And to me, this came across as an appeal to mystery. Maybe I misunderstood what you were saying, but it seemed like you were essentially saying, um, well, look, if God is all powerful and if God is all loving, then we can trust that he wouldn't allow evil unless it was justified. So if there's evil, there must be a justification for it, which is to me kind of like throwing up a hand and saying, well, look, I want to keep my belief in God and I know there's evil. So there's, there's got to be some reason for it. I don't know what that reason is, but there's got to be a reason. That to me is like me standing over the floor of my murdered dead friend and somebody else kind of saying, yeah, there's, there's probably a reason for it. You know, I, I have this belief that, um, you know, the person who killed him is an intrinsically good person. You know, the person who killed your friend is a friend of mine, and I think he's a really good person. So, like, I'm sure there must be exp some explanation as to why he murdered him and stole his wallet. I, I would think, look, it's it's going to need more than that, you know? And I don't think, although technically, I guess philosophically, you could say that the burden of proof would be on me to say that there's no way that there could be a justifiable reason that my friend is now dead on the floor. Sure, if I was making that claim. But if I'm just making a, an evidential claim that it's probably quite unlikely that there's a good reason for my friend to have been murdered um i think the burden would be on the other person to show me why there was a good reason not for me to show why there can't be such a good reason um analogously 
I don't think I should have to show why there can't be uh, some good reason that may exist, as Augustine refers to, to allow evil. It should rather be on Augustine or yourself to show what that reason is. Turn the defense into a theodicy, in other words. Um, one minute and 15 seconds. Can we talk about the suffering of Christ. Sure. Again, I just, I'll, I'll refer to something I said earlier. Um, you said, and I think this is a direct quote, the answer to a world of torture and murder is a God who was tortured and murdered. Again, another solution um, is to not have the suffering and the murder in the first place. Saying we can't understand suffering without Jesus, which is how you opened that segment. You said we, we can't understand this problem of evil without Jesus, would be kind of like me saying we can't understand cancer without chemotherapy, right? The answer to a world of cancer is a world of chemotherapy. Or the answer to a world of cancer is a world without cancer. That seems to me preferable. Um, you can see that all of the points that I'm making here in rebuttal, um, and the reason that it's all coming back to the same point, is I think that's the same underlying assumption that actually, yes, it does make sense to say that if there's some great good justified by, a, by some great or lesser evil, let's say, but the only reason why that great good is good is by virtue of overcoming the evil, then I do think it makes sense to say we'd rather have neither. There can still be goods without there necessarily being virtues. There can still be goods without there necessarily being evils that have to be overcome. And sure, we'll miss out on some of the goods that we would have had if evil did exist, like virtue, did exist, like virtue, but I think we can do without them. Okay, let's turn to Inspiring Philosophies second rebuttal, and this one is going to be five minutes long, so let me just set my clock here. And whenever you're ready, Michael, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Okay, so first I just want to uh, clarify on the rainforest example. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's all just about beauty. What I'm talking more about is the intrinsic goodness of life itself. Uh, you know, you could say the, in, the aesthetic beauty is an aspect of that. But what I'm saying is we ultimately believe that preserving the life itself because of its intrinsic goodness is better than uh, letting it go, even though it will continue on in intense suffering. Um, and so I also want to hit on this one point because I think there is a, an underlying assumption. I think you're right about this. I think we're not defining good the same way. And this is what I talked about a little bit in my opening statement. Uh, if good is just pleasure, uh, if good is just uh, that and suffering is just bad, then I don't think we're going to agree because I don't, I'm not uh, a utilitarian. I would define good more in terms of virtue ethics. A deontologist would define good more in terms of actions. So if goodness is about virtues, then we, and not about pleasure and pain or pleasure and suffering, then those are, uh, in a sense, kind of side issues in the main goal. I'm not saying that they're not included in this. I definitely don't want people to think that, but the main goal is to build virtuous creatures. Now, we're also assuming pleasure is the best possible world bill on that. I, I would not at all agree. I think a world with virtuous people and suffering is far better than a world without virtuous people, and it's just pleasure. I feel like that is a far less robust world. This might not be the right term, but a far less interesting world, um, a far less complex, multi-dimensional, nuanced world in that sense. It doesn't really create uh, what I think God's aim is to, which is to create virtuous individuals for relationships, uh, examples. Um, so I think the problem is, and you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think the world you're setting up is a world of the Stepford Wives, where everyone doesn't have to worry about problems or pain. Everyone it just sort of goes along, they're happy, they never have to experience suffering. They just go along with their daily task. And that to me sounds like a dystopian horror. I mean, that's what it is, it's a dystopian horror film in that sense. And we ultimately think that we would reject that type of world, even though it's filled with pleasure. No one has to worry about any dangers or anything with regards to that. And I think you kind of even hinted at this, because you said, you know, the goal of science is to remove ignorance. But doesn't that, that imply we're trying to achieve something other than just pleasure? We're trying to become intelligent individuals as well as virtuous individuals. It's not just about pleasure. I mean, we could say it'd be far better to be like a Stepford wife. You don't have to worry about science. You don't have to worry about growing in knowledge. Just go along our daily task and just accept that this is wonderful and not worry about anything else. I think that such a world is far worse. And this is something Clay Jones brings up extensively in his book on the problem of evil, is that he highlights examples in science fiction. That we taught, they, they set up these worlds where everyone is happy, there's pleasure, it's wonderful. Come join us, there's, but there's no freedom, you don't have to think. And everyone rejects that. We recognize intrinsically those worlds are horrible. So I don't think a world just filled with pleasure would be a best possible world. I think it's kind of ironic because C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce defines that as hell. In the gray town, in hell, everyone can just think whatever they want to existence and they're absolutely miserable. 
Whereas in heaven, there are virtuous people who are trying to call to the people in hell to come up because they, there's a far better existence. But there is suffering, and that's why the people in hell never come up because they don't want to go through the suffering to get to heaven. So I think it really depends on what we mean by good. I don't think pleasure is necessarily the best possible world. I think that is an aspect of it, but I think it's secondary to the main goal, which is to create virtuous, good people in that sense. So I think that's going to be a fundamental disagreement there. So, But I also think this creates a, overall a problem for the argument from evil, because you have to assume it seems objective right and wrong, so more realism, and it seems you have to assume some sort of utilitarian or more generally a consequentialist type view in that sense. So it seems like it's so much contingent on these underlying assumptions that it doesn't really have the full force of what people think it does, because it really depends on what obligations are, what is actually good, and what actually is evil. Um, With that, I don't think there's really much else to address. Again, I would say that I do think suffering can be used for instrumental goodness. Uh, I don't think, but I also want to say, I don't think that it has to be. I'm not going to argue that all suffering has to be put in the universe for there to be good. I can think of The Lord of the Rings, which you've not read, but at one point, Frodo gets attacked by a giant spider. The story could have been just fine without that. It, it was not necessarily had to be part of it, but that put, was put in there, I think, as an example, maybe you could say of gratuitous suffering. So, but ultimately, though, when we look at that story, it's the triumph itself that is what is the the intrinsic goodness of that. The suffering itself is never outshined by the overall goodness. And when we take our world and put it in comparison to eternity, there's nothing that could really fathom the amount of suffering. I just go back to my analogy with childhood suffering versus your adult life now. We don't remember it all. Same with our dreams. We don't remember it because the goodness always pales in comparison. All right, let's turn it back over to Alex. Let me pull up my countdown here. So five minutes for your second rebuttal, Alex. And once I've got it up on the screen here, yep, whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start the timer. Okay, let's see what we can do. Uh, Time is running short. Um, On the rainforest point, maybe I I misunderstood exactly what you were saying, but I think the 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 point still holds, um, but we can discuss that later, perhaps. But I, I, uh, if if I did kind of misunderstand your point, then I want people to know that that's the case and to go back and listen to what you said, rather than trust my analysis of it. Um, on the point of kind of utilitarianism, I, I think that most of what I've said doesn't rely on the proposition that bad is suffering, but that suffering is bad. So bad is not by definition suffering. They're not definitionally the same thing but that suffering is an example of a bad thing. This is essentially the argument that G.E. Moore makes uh, in Principia Ethica as a, as a criticism of utilitarianism. He says, look, I essentially agree that everything that is bad is suffering and everything that is suffering is bad, but they're, just, they're not definitionally the same thing. So I'm not making that utilitarian claim that something that is bad is by definition just what is suffering. I'm saying that suffering has the property of badness, whatever badness may be. Um, I'd also like to respond to the point you make about soul building, especially because earlier you applied it to animals, um, or at least quoted someone who did. Uh, you said, in, in your words, it was something like, you know, God allows this to happen because he knows you'll get through it and you'll be better for it. I'd like to know, as pertains to animals, when a, when a pig is put into a gas chamber, how the pig is better off for it, especially if a pig doesn't have the kind of same capacities for for insolment as we do and isn't going to kind of achieve the same heavenly existence as we do unless you believe in some kind of um pig heaven or something like that i I, i'm not sure it sounds like a fatuous point but that's only because of how fatuously people treat animal ethics um rather than it actually being a silly idea to have something like pig heaven um but you know of course that's moral evil but if a deer gets its leg caught under a under a falling tree and starves to death in the forest in agony and confusion who's that benefiting it's not benefiting any human soul it's not benefiting any god as far as i can see and it's certainly not benefiting the deer um i really don't see what explanation there can possibly be to this and bear in mind the people listening i mean um that every argument that seems to be put forward about you know free will and loving god and about higher order goods and about personal development and responsibility none of these seem to apply to animals none of them which leads people like descartes to say that animals can't feel pain which leads people like C.S. Lewis to entertain the idea that animals can't feel pain or at the very least feel it in a different way to we do because there's just no other way to explain the fact that these animals experience so much suffering because as C.S. Lewis notes in The Problem of Pain in his chapter on animal suffering, it's like 
I don't know what else we can do here. The traditional responses don't seem to hold. We've got to come up with something better, or we just have to entertain the idea that maybe animals don't feel suffering, or their suffering isn't somehow different qualitatively to ours. The issue of animal suffering is probably more troubling and more important an argument than the issue of human suffering, although, of course, human suffering is a derivative of animal suffering, and yet it never gets a mention. It doesn't get a mention in, in the video that you made, Michael, except may, I think there was one like passing mention to it, but not even kind of directly addressing it, just used as, a, as an example. Um, in any debate that I've watched, in any essay I read or book I read, except for maybe something like The Problem of Pain, it doesn't get a mention. But, and why should it? Because it poses the hardest problem. Because any, any argument you can put forward to how people are benefited by pain, there's just no way that I can see, and no argument that I've heard, I should say, more importantly, that says that those justifications can apply to that deer in that forest that no one ever knows even existed. Um, on the point of dystopia, it's worth noting there are two responses to this really quickly. Firstly, something like a totalitarian dictatorship is only bad if the totalitarian dictator is not perfectly moral. Um, of course, that's the reason why totalitarianism is bad, because, yeah, sure, it sounds like a good idea to have somebody in control who knows what's best for you and, and, and make sure that everything that happens is best for you. The reason why we think totalitarianism is grotesque is because people are corruptible, and if you put them in a position of power, they're going to become corrupt and they're going to make life worse for you. That's the point of Orwell's Animal Farm. Um, however, if you put God in that position, you wouldn't have that problem. The, the actual critique at the basis of our response to totalitarianism would disappear. But even if dystopia is bad, if God's at the top of it, even if totalitarianism is bad, if God's at the top of it, um, this would make it a kind of evil, right? This would make it a kind of badness. So by saying that God allows evil to prevent something like totalitarianism, God is not allowing evil, but still minimizing it because he's minimizing the risk of the evil of totalitarianism. He's not allowing evil despite the totalitarianism. He's recognizing that lowering that evil would raise the evil of totalitarianism and so wants the overall evil to be less um that's how i respond to those points as for frodo and the spider um it may be good for the sake of the story being entertaining you say it's better that that part was in the book it may be better because it was entertaining for the reader but was it better for frodo probably not and if the only reason that it was good to include that in the story was for the benefit of the reader the implication would be that the only reason it's good to allow suffering uh on you know, it, it, analogously, it would be for the entertainment of God, which I think is a pretty grotesque impl implication that I don't think you were trying to make. Um, but those are my reflections. Okay, let's move to some Q&A. So I, I just wanted to say that I've really enjoyed the the back and forth. We don't normally do these types of like formal debates on, on the channel. So it's been interesting to see the, the different dynamic that's happening. But I really enjoyed both of your openings. I enjoyed the, the back and forth there. So let's get into a question. This one looks like a might be a question. This was, I think, before I said to make sure you're addressing who, who you're asking your question to. But this one looks like it's a question for Alex from Sarah Rainey. Thank you for your super chat. She says, is it possible that beings who can make choices and experience morality, like being kind, could yield deeper relationships than beings who couldn't? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it does. Like, I'm sure that the pe people are bound by experiences of suffering. One of, one of the greatest ways to bind two people is for them to experience suffering together. Uh, together, it's a, it's a kind of drawing out of this traditional idea that the best way for two people to bond is to put them both uh, setting up some furniture from Ikea, right? Because, you know, by, by overcoming that struggle together, they're bonded. Um, that same psychological principle applies to great suffering and great horrors where people are totally bound by it. Now, again, what this would be an example of would be suffering as an instrumental good. Um, so, yes, something really bad has happened, but it's allowed people to be bound uh, by, by, by that suffering, right? Um, I think we have to be careful about how we respond to this, right? Because if somebody says something like, two survivors of the Holocaust may be really well bonded and have a really rich relationship that they wouldn't have otherwise have had. And I read a paper recently where someone uses the example of Viktor Frankl and basically says that he implies in uh, Man's Search for Meaning that he was better off because of the Holocaust, right? I don't think anyone in their right mind could say that because the richness of, uh, of human bonding and relationship that came out of the Holocaust, somehow the Holocaust was good, right? Now, the, the reason why people don't want to say this or why it's tricky to say this, um, to use a more trivial example, I sometimes say that I wish I went to a different college um, at, at university. There are various colleges. And sometimes I think, man, I, I would have had more fun at this college. And my friends always say to me, sure, yeah, I mean, like maybe this college just kind of suck in this way or that way. But if you hadn't gone to that college, you'd never have met us and we wouldn't have our, our, our great relationship. And I have to kind of put on my philosophical cap and say, well, 
yeah, um, but I wouldn't be troubled by that because I never would have met you. And I, I would have other friends who'd be saying the same thing about me if I said that I'd rather have gone to the college I actually did. Um, in other words, because we're in the situation where something bad has happened and a great result has come out like a, like a strong relationship and friendship, we might be tempted to think, damn, I'm, I'm glad it happened because I wouldn't have this relationship. But if the suffering didn't happen and the relationship didn't happen, other good things would have happened that didn't happen in the real world. Um, and it's, it, it's just not worth the amount of suffering that is in the world for something like, you know, a particular friendship to develop, in my view. So we didn't de Yeah, we didn't determine this be beforehand, but I was going to see if you guys wanted to, to allow some back and forth in this section. I think this question is trying to hit to the point of what I'm getting at is that what are we defining as good and evil? I mean, if if the let's just say in a hypothetical that the the best of all the best of all the highest goods was deeper relationships and not so much pleasure, then ultimately the obligation would be to aim for this and that would be and then you could see that the 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 evil or the suffering in that could be far more instrumentally good than its intrinsic badness in that sense. So we need to be very careful on what we're defining here as good and evil. Sure, other good things could have happened, but would it have been the sort of goodness that maybe God truly is trying to aim for with, like, example, like deeper relationships? So I think this is trying to get to the heart of what we mean. If we're going to talk about evil and the problem of evil, we first have to be clear on what is good. We just can't assume that it is definitely going to be pleasure and that suffering is necessarily going to be always bad. Yeah, um, I would I would just say that in my view... Uh, if something like the development of a relationship is good, it's good insofar as it brings people pleasure, right? Um, this is kind of a, it, it's a very basic psychologically utilitarian point to make, but I think it roughly holds, which is that it doesn't make much sense to talk about intrinsic goodness of something like a relationship. Um, I think what we mean to say is that we derive goods from having that relationship, right? My relationship with my friends, my relationship with my family, the reason I value those things is because of, of all the things that flow from them, because of the conversations that flow from them, the pleasure I get from that, from the from the feeling of safety and the feeling of friendship that I that I feel, the pleasure of that. But not that the, the thing itself, the act in isolation of just two people entering into a, a, a social contract by which they say they both like each other intrinsically doesn't have any moral component to me. It's just a descriptive fact from which moral goods can be... Um, can be taken but it, it, as you say this is just kind of a disagreement on meta ethics and i think that what the the audience needs to kind of consider is whatever their view of ethics is whatever they think is good and whatever they think is bad even if they think there are different kinds of goods and different kinds of good uh, bads that are being talked about whatever kind of bad you think exists in the world right and whatever kind of good you think exists in the world and if they're on different levels if they're of different kinds does one justify the other would you given the option to create a new world that had exactly the same status of evil and pleasure as this actual world did, would you allow the same level of suffering just because you knew the same level of pleasure would come out? Or would you think, you know what, I don't think this is worth it. I don't think I would give a child cancer so that their family can be better off afterwards. If that's your uh, answer, then I think you have to think about this quite deeply. Real, real quick, just to respond to that, uh, I think we have tons of examples in human history that no one would actually create that world because the books we write are constantly filled with suffering. Same with the movies, because we have recognized the triumph is far more intrinsically better than any of the suffering in that. And again, in our world, we have to put in the factor, or the idea of soul building and eternity. Yes, there is suffering, but it will be outweighed by the in total fullness of eternity and turn all that suffering into joys in that sense. So yeah, there is suffering. But at the same time, it's also about God's obligations to build virtuous people for that eternity. Okay, let's move on to another question from David LaRosa. Thank you for your super chat. He says, as a former solipsist, I could not explain uh, my own suffering. Is it possible that only in a world of free will and suffu suffused with evil, supererogatory acts, the experience of unconditional love exists, and thus a paradigm, God? I think this is another question for Alex. Uh, potentially, I'm I'm struggling to understand exactly what the question is here. Every uh, time I hear solipsist, I just think of that episode of the Atheist Experience where Matt Dillon is going, "You're a thinking solipsist." The same, thinking of the same thing, <laughs> thinking exactly the same thing. Um, is it possible that only in a world of free will, suffused with evil, supererogatory acts? Um, I I think maybe the question is is kind of asking something that's already been asked in, in other words that only in a world with free will that is therefore suffused with evil, um, things like supererogatory acts 
could exist. So things things like virtuous behavior. Um, I might be misinterpreting that. Uh, ho- it almost sounds that like he's. Maybe- it, it almost sounds like he's asking if whether whether or not God is an explanation of evil. Um, yeah, well, that, well that's my interpretation. That's case, that that's something that people ask a lot. That's that's the case that Frank Turek made. Um, since we discussed him earlier, when he kind of says, "Well, look, yeah, yeah, in order to even talk about the the nature of evil, in order to, to to talk about the problem of evil, you need some kind of God to to make sense of the concept of evil." Um, I think the implication in this question is that only in a world of free will and suffused with evil, um, is that it, the the question that arises is whether free will really does require evil really does require the level of evil um and how that can kind of be how that can be justified right michael earlier made a point about how um we can't understand this concept of free will and human evil and, and w- without considering the fall of adam um which in the video that's the the, the video that you made michael the hour-long one um this was a big point was kind of the point of, of human depravity it's like like we are just totally uh we are totally depraved because of because of the fall of adam and therefore you know, we live in a world suffused with evil because of that w- free will, and that free will necessitated it. I wouldn't word it like that. I wouldn't say it's just because of Adam. No. Uh, you were okay. Um, uh, my understanding was that you said it was kind of an intrinsic part of human nature, at the very least, that we are just evil beings. We are, we are, we are depraved. Um, so I quoted C.S. Lewis on this. I pointed out that the moment you have a self, there's a possibility to put that self before you. So just being a self just necessitates the possibility. And just the openness that there will be evil in that sense. So, and in that sense, we have sort of turned ourselves into these evil beings by being selves, just by the very nature of it. So, so if by the very nature of our being we are evil, that seems to imply that by necessity we are evil. Um, how can it make sense to talk about the possibility of these beings doing good if we are kind of by necessity evil? Or, or I should frame it like this, if, if we are by necessity evil because of our nature then how can we be held responsible for that evil if it, if it is just a a point of fact that our nature requires that we have this this evil tendency how can we be held responsible for that evil tendency well, i don't think we are I, I would not take the augustinian view that all men are born guilty i would agree with greek orthodox church that all men are born just with a nature but you're only uh, guilty for your own sin but even in that no one is really condemned to hell for their sin people are condemned to hell because they want to be there in that full sense. And so I, I dive more into that in this. Like, my video on hell is not about the ontology of hell. My video on hell is more about the psychology of hell and mm-hmm. what's sort of going on there. So I don't think, in, in the Christian worldview, no one is is actually condemned for their sin because, you know, John chapter 3, or, or John, I believe, maybe it's 2, but uh, John the Baptist says the Lamb of God has come to take away the sin in the world. So the sin has already been taken away. If God is responsible for our nature, then he has taken it upon himself and done away with it. The only people in hell are the people who want to be there. As Dallas Willard said, God will let anyone into heaven who can stomach it, animals included. Do you mind if we move um, on to another question? Yeah, certainly. I, I, I fear that we may, may have misunderstood what the question was supposed to be. Perhaps if, if David, if you if send, send me an email or something and, and let me know if, if we got it right. Um, I just, I, I feel bad if someone's kind of spent money to ask a question and we haven't sufficiently answered it. So feel free to just email me afterwards. That's a great option. Yeah. Okay, so from Gurgly Nagy, he says, maybe true, and this one, I think it's either one, but let's let's give it to to uh, Michael. I don't know why I just for- forgot your name. He says, maybe true that the evil makes God hypothesis extremely unlikely, but don't you think we have additional arguments which make the hypothesis more likely? Oh, exactly. That's what I, I talked about in my opening statement, is that there is evidence for Christian theism independent of evil, and the argument of evil seems to be dependent mm-hmm. upon a meta-ethical view of moral realism and a normative ethical view of a utilitarianism for it to even work. So, I mean, this is what I said in my opening statement. Even if the argument from evil is successful, uh, you could just become a, a nihilist in that sense, because I know Christians that are moral nihilists, surprisingly, and just say, well, that evil and good, suffering, this is all arbitrary. Uh, it doesn't really would affect the ontological or the metaphysical nature of God in its sense. Uh, so is I think I got the question answered, but yep. if I'm wrong, please correct me. But, yeah. I, I, yeah, would, it, I would like to perhaps point out that when I hear the, the phrase the evil God hypothesis, um, oh no, sorry, it makes God hypothesis. Yep, the sorry, a- I, evil I, makes I, God I, I read the evil God hypothesis, although um, I, that, that might be an interesting thing to talk about in, in our back and forth, but I worry it's a slightly different question about kind of there could be a God exists that is evil. Um, the, the, the way that I would see it as being relevant uh, to the kind of present discussion 
is that one of the ways in which people like to say that we know that God can be good and, and exist as a good God um, is because although there's evil, there seems to be all this good that's necessitated by the evil. One can't exist without the other. This is the discussion we've kind of been having is that, well, we know that God can be good because the good in the world necessitates the evil. They come as a package so we can still say God is good, but that seems to be able to be turned on its head. And I could say, well, how do we know that God isn't evil? Um, and of course, you know, definitionally, people will say God is a maximally uh, moral being, but there are at least theories of morality. You could be, say, a Christian moral nihilist who thinks that God is maximally evil. Um, and the argument would be something like, well, no, that can't be the case because there's so much good in the world, right? If God was if God was evil, he would make things maximally evil. There'd be so much evil in the world and there's not enough evil to make that the case. But the exact reverse argument could be made that without some pleasures, there can't be some evils, right? Without the knowledge of pleasures in the world, we wouldn't be able to fully um, experience the evils that we experience. Uh, without calm, we wouldn't know what the experience of, of chaos was, this kind of thing. So it feels like the arguments that we're making to defend a, a good God hypothesis can be completely turned on the head and made in the reverse for an evil God. And the best way I've ever put, seen this put is by Stephen Law in his debate with William Lane Craig years and years ago. Um, he makes this point really well, I think, if people are interested, but I'm not sure how relevant it is to the present discussion. Yeah, I'm going to let Michael decide whether or not he wants to uh, respond to that or whether you, you'd like to move to another question. Uh, just see my video on the evil God challenge, which I did mm. about a year ago. All right, this one is from a friend of mine. His name is Ale. He says, to Inspiring Philosophy, explain the distinction between being unjustified in allowing evil and allowing gratuitous evil and the distinct roles they play in the discussion. Explain the distinction between being unjustified and allowing evil and allowing gratuitous evil and the distinction roles play in the... So I'm, I think I probably need more clarification to really get at what this thing... Now, I, as I said earlier, I didn't, I, I didn't plan, I'm not saying that gratuitous evil does not exist. So... I would need to know what he, how these different phrases are defined. So we want, I think between being unjustified in allowing evil and allowing gratuitous evil and the distinction, the distinct roles they play in the discussion. So I'll try to hit this as best I can, but I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding it. Uh, I think. Yeah, to me, I, and I wish I could provide more clarity to you, but it, it looks like they, these to me look very similar. Like these, these two things he's pointing out. So yeah, I mean, like I would not. I'm not saying this is what I was gonna. Uh, I wrote down some notes to in reply to Alex's last uh, rebuttal period. Is that I'm not saying that suffering is intrinsically good. I'm saying it can be instrumentally good. I'm not saying that if suffering happens, the person is necessarily better off. I would build on uh, Josh Rasmussen. And by the way, Alex, you did mention you didn't think anyone's ever really addressed the problem of animal pain. I could recommend two things really easy. There's a book by Trent Doherty called The Problem of Animal Pain. Yep. And there is a paper by Josh Rasmussen called A Randomness-Based Composite Theodicy for Evolutionary Evil. So I could send those both to you if you're interested. Uh, but I don't – myself and the authors are not saying that we think they're better off uh, in that sense. We're not saying that gratuitous evil does not exist. We're saying that the suffering can be used for instrumental goodness, but it doesn't even necessarily need to be. What we're saying is, though, is that God has sort of created a universe where though, when those things arise, uh, they will ultimately always be defeated if the free creature you know, allows them to be uh, by going through a process with God. Uh, we're not saying that uh, they're better to go through that suffering. I don't think a lot of the suffering I went through as a child means, oh, I needed to go through that to become the person I am. I'm not saying that at all. We're saying that these are examples of chaos. These are examples of a universe where there are free creatures. And ultimately, though, the universe has this law of triumph and beauty in it that will always show outshine the evil in that sense. It can always be overcome with every individual. So I'm not saying it's justified, but I'm also not saying it was a, it was determined by God or it has to be used by God. I'm saying God in soul building, there's going to be randomness, there's going to be chaos if it's going to be built by free creatures themselves and not by God determining everything. So I, I don't – and then it also goes back to what we mean by the ultimate aim or the ultimate – end of God? Is it a utilitarian view or is it like a deontology view or is it, an, is it a virtue ethicist view in that sense? So there's a lot more to be said on there, but I don't I don't know if I'm getting the whole question right here. Well, this is actually, a, I've got another question here queued up and this one is, is on virtue ethics. It's addressed to you uh, from Shad Spark. Thank you for your super chat. He says, how does virtue ethics justify which virtues are good and how does that not reduce virtue ethics down to consequentialism? Great point. Um, so yeah, I would agree with, uh, agree with Trent Doherty that it's not entirely opposed to consequentialism. Uh, virtue ethics, 
I mean, really, all the fields of Essex do blur into one another, let's be honest. It's not like they're mm -hmm. so and, and they're edgily distinct that, you know, I mean, even a deontologist will talk about we have to do good actions because ultimately that will create less suffering in the long run, even though their ultimate aim is not to reduce suffering, but to have good actions. So in terms of what uh, virtues we justify as good, uh, this is a difficult question, and as any virtue ethicist will say, ethics is quite messy. It's not always going to have clear-cut, definitive ways in order to define these things. Circumstances are always going to play a role in that type of thing, on how to be virtuous. So in some sense, it does kind of come down to a little bit on intuition, on understanding moral progress, uh, understanding what has... Um, what sort of consequences are being created. Because again, virtue ethics is not entirely opposed to consequentialism in that sense. So it, it, there, are, so the best way to sort of look at it is sort of to take those consequences into, a, into a consideration, look at them and sort of say, well, what, is this helping us be more virtuous in the long run? But I mean, ultimately the goal is to create virtuous people, not um, then you could say that is a consequence in that sense. But um, it's not about the ultimate goal would not be defined in terms of pleasure or pain, but more in terms of bringing about certain ethical values and how to act in that. So, again, it's a very messy situation, and it would be very hard to put it down in different circumstances. I, Alex, I, would, I would just – yeah, I'm kind of just itching to say that, like, it's only difficult and messy if we're, if we're, if we're clinging on to this idea that virtue ethics isn't reducible to consequentialism. As you say, virtue ethics isn't – at odds with consequentialism and it's clearly kind of the reason why we adopt certain virtues not others is because they lead to a better outcome not necessarily pleasure and pain but like it seems to me that what we're kind of implicitly accepting here is that we determine which virtues are in fact virtuous by the consequences that they lead to to me this is like obviously true of virtue ethics um which i've thought a lot about and spent a lot of time trying to find ways around um but I can only see a, a, a rationale for justifying virtue ethics that ultimately collapses into consequentialism. I would kind of be wary of the, the argumentation that you were using there, Michael, because it seemed to me like you were almost kind of accepting, almost just agreeing with the point that virtue ethics does, in some sense at least, collapse into consequentialism, unless you can provide a, a rationale for saying that virtues can be good in and of themselves completely regardless of the consequences that they bring about um which it sounded like you you weren't doing uh, maybe i'm just completely misunderstanding what well, you're I saying mean, but it, it sounded like so many times you were saying that actually virtues are good as a result of the the ends that they bring about well we could think of uh, for example the fat man and the trolley example we would say mm -hmm. would not be virtuous to act in that way to push the fat man over the bridge to prevent the five people from being murdered even sure. though it would create more suffering in that sense so you can think of different hypotheticals along the way where it, the virtues themselves uh, are sort of themselves their own goal in the end. Sure, but so the, the important question there is why not? Why is it not virtuous to push the fat man? Uh, and uh, the, so obviously that example is, is given as compared to pulling the lever and kind of saying, well, why is one virtuous and one not? We, the, the, the question we're interested in here, the question that's kind of being asked by Shad Spark is – what is our kind of determination for why pushing the fat man is not virtuous? And to me, the reason why it's not virtuous to push the fat man is because even though a base level analysis of consequentialism would say, if you push the fat man, less people die. For any listeners who don't know, you're pushing the fat man to stop the trolley hitting five people and all people are innocent, right? Seems to be that, well, consequentialism would say that if you push the fat man, less people die. So the consequences are better. And yet it's not virtuous to push the fat man. But no, the consequence of pushing the fat man is living in an ethical world where we've agreed that it's okay to take people on the street and push them over a bridge if it's going to result in in people being saved and that would be a bad end that would be a bad world to live in in other words it's not virtuous because the consequence of uh, of instilling that as part of our virtue ethics would be a worse world right it, it's bad by virtue of its consequences right right but also i mean building on even kant even though i disagree with him on a lot of things we could say that it's just good in of itself the same way the categorical imperative is just simply good in of itself. I mean, Kant would say it's wrong to murder just because it's wrong to murder. That's just it. it. Doesn't refer to the consequences. But if we lived in a world where we knew that if we did push fat man off bridges to prevent more suffering, that it would lead to more pleasure ultimately, we would still recognize that it was still not virtuous to do such a thing in and of itself, regardless of the consequences in that action, even though it created more pleasure. So yeah, I'm not denying consequentialism doesn't play at all into my into my in my role in understanding virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. I think there is, as I said in the beginning, 
they're all they're quite blurry. It's quite messy. Ethics is quite messy. It, you know, it, it sounds like you're making it more messy than it needs to be. You know, like there, know. there seem to be simpler explanations for these things as long as we're willing to stop clinging on to ideas of virtue ethics that 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 are just kind of for some reason just strictly opposed to accepting that there's consequentialism at the basis of their motivations. Like just do that, and I'm sure that we'll be a lot happier and we'll be able to clear up the mess quite quickly. All right. Well, let's... I mean, I think I. Oh yeah, we'll just move on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's move on to uh, another question here and this one's for alex from gina m thank you for your super chat she says how would you respond to an argument that a world without virtue would create a world of evil for example in a world that would not permit the growth of forgiveness people would become so selfish as to be prone to evil well uh bear in mind the argument that i was making was that it's not worth having evil in the world for the sake of virtue um reason being that you know i'd rather have no evil and no virtue and the question is being asked but what if it were the case that by allowing a world without virtue, more evil would be produced? Well, look, bear in mind, what I'm trying to do here is minimize evil. And the first step of my argument is to say, to minimize evil in the first instance means to get rid of the, 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 the virtue, right? So in order to achieve this end of minimizing evil, I'm going to disallow virtue, all these particular virtues from existing, because we're going to disallow the evils which, they, which need to be there in order for the virtue to exist. Then you ask, but what if that leads to more evil? Well, if that were the case, then it wouldn't be a minimization of evil, right? So we would allow the virtues because then it would actually be worth it, right? So the point that someone like Michael will make is virtues are worth the, the kind of evil that, that, that comes about in order to produce them. Um, this would be the case in a world wherein if we could show that without virtue there would be more evil, then yeah, it would be worth it. What I'm saying is that in the actual world that we live in, I don't think that is the case. I don't think it is the case that if we got rid of cancer and got rid of chemotherapy, that would be overall bad because it would lead to some kind of badness. I don't think that if we got rid of uh, fear and we got rid of bravery, that that would lead to, lead to some kind of evil. Um, potentially it would. And if there's an argument for it, I'd love to hear it. Um, but just bear in mind that like, my, my position is very simple and it's very open to being changed. If you can show me that a different course of action would actually lead to a minimization of suffering, then I'll take it, right? That That's as simple as it gets. Like would, people often ask, what would change your mind in any kind of debate? And for me, it, 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 on a moral discussion like this, if you can show to me that actually, yeah, getting rid of this particular virtue would lead to more evil, then I'd say, okay, don't get rid of the evil. Uh, don't get rid of the virtue. Um, it would just be as simple as that for me. I would highly recommend the best way to change your mind on that is to have children. You'll learn very quickly that what you do have really to is. allow some suffering to make their lives far better in the long run. And you said you like, should, uh, you'd rather have no evil and no virtue. And all I keep thinking is this hypothetical world where God is like just forcing pleasure on like you just all these free creatures are created, but they're always just in pleasure. And I just think it just takes me right back to Stepford Wise. That sounds like a horrible world where we don't really become mature growing individuals. We're just these children in these pleasure machines. And that to me sounds like some sort of dystopian type world it may sound good on the surface it may feel emotionally good to us but ultimately though from ever since i had my daughter i it just seems far better for her in the long run to sort of allow some suffering i mean i'm, I'm not i don't want you know horrible suffering to obviously to happen to her but it'll allow some suffering in order to her to become a far better mature virtuous individual and in terms of consequentialism we would say the consequences of that are go are far better in the long run and so then we can actually say that it'd be hard to deny that suffering does not have instrumental goodness in that sense. Um, it, so, speak, Alex, I have speak a... to to David Benatar, I was going to say. Um, he might kind of change your mind on some of these. But I just have to say, this is really important to me. Um, you said uh, about your own child, you know, you, you say that it's worth having some suffering. And then you kind of say as an offside, of course, I wouldn't want my child to have, like, immense suffering. Like, why not? Yeah. But, well, because but why not? All, right? Because but, but here's, here's, here's the thing that's implicitly, implicitly being said here. You've just constructed a case that says that it's justifiable in the world um, for God to allow children to get cancer or something like this. But at the same time, you're kind of saying, well, if I were in the position of God, I, I, you know, I understand why he would allow some suffering, but I wouldn't allow a lot of suffering. It's like, why, why, why would you construct a case where by analogy, if you were at the helm, you wouldn't allow your child to have a lot of suffering, but you're okay because with God allowing someone else's child to have a lot of suffering. I'm not omniscient, and I'm far more, I'm very emotionally invested, and I'm not fully knowledgeable on the case. Now, once again, this goes back to my opening statement in terms of eternity, the dreamlike nature of this world, God's moral obligations, and fully understand how to heal the wounds in eternity. I'm just saying, me as a parent, 
I would never put enough suffering onto my child that I know she could not overcome. And I would say God would do the exact same thing with his knowledge and his circumstances. Okay, I've okay, got so I've got another question for you, Alex, that's queued up and it's on the same it's it's in the same ballpark. Are you okay if I bring it up? Um I, I would just be I I'm fine to answer it, but I, I I'm really interested in just pressing this point, which is um you, you said, Michael, that you wouldn't inflict more suffering on your child than you know they could overcome. What what if like I could show to you like by some time traveling device that if you gave your child a horrible horrible disease that they were gonna manage to overcome it and they got lots of good things out of it they became like a strong character would you be okay with me injecting that disease into them i think not even if you were in a position of omniscience to know that once that they were capable of getting through it and that once they'd gone through it they would develop certain virtues i think you'd still rather say no i'd rather not have my child go through that even due, e- even with the results that are, that, that are going to come out yeah. but this is what we're saying when we say that God can justify suffering because it leads to certain virtues. We say that he knows that this person is going to suffer in the way that your child would suffer, but he has no quarrel with that. He says, that's fine. I think it's worth it. And and you said that you didn't have omniscience. When I asked you about that, you said, well, I'm not in a position of omnipotence and omniscience. And I'm giving you that, I'm giving you that opportunity. I'm saying, here's an example where as a time traveler, you can have that omniscience and know that your child will overcome it and will be a better person for it. But you still say that you wouldn't inflict it upon them. And you've got to ask yourself, why not? Because uh, there's a difference between when something happens in part of like a random chaotic universe versus the actual action of inflicting the pain. I don't think God is necessarily the one giving people cancer. I'm simply saying that we are part of this random soul-building universe, and he is allowing us to be able to overcome it. Maybe that was a clumsy wording then. So let's say that instead I am about to inject this disease into your child and you have the opportunity to stop me, right? Because this is the situation mm-hmm. that God would be in. As, as you rightly point out, I was wrong. It would be more analogous to say that you have the opportunity to prevent your child from having a horrible disease. Um, I'd imagine that you'd still do that. You'd still knock the needle out of my hand. Even if I was a time traveler who said, no, 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 listen to me. I'm, I'm doing this for, her, for you know his or her own sake. You'd probably still want to knock that needle out of my hand. And if you would then you've got to ask if it's not good enough for your child and why is it good enough for anybody else's? Well, of course it would. I'm emotionally invested. I'm not omniscient and I'm, I don't fully understand the situation. I mean, I'm not going to deny my own subjective. I mean, I open by pointing out there is an emotional sting of evil and I'm going to do everything I can to fight that. But again, it goes back to my point of quoting Eric Reitman in my opening statement. Okay, let's move on to another question from Anthony Buck. And this one is to Alex. Why would you assume to be able to understand God's reasoning? Could you explain hand sanitizer to your skin cells? Seems you're assuming the human capacity for understanding is infinite. Well, no, I mean, I'm not the one making the claim that I know why evil exists, right? I, as, a, as an atheist, I could be some kind of existentialist or nihilist or absurdist who just says, look, I know that suffering exists, I have no idea why it exists, and I'm just going to have to put up with it. Um, but I'm faced with an ideology, a religion, a, a system of thought that says, actually, no, like, we know, or we think, that this evil is justified. And I'm saying, how on earth do you know that? Like, what what argument do you have? And it, there are kind of two ways to go about it. There's one way of saying, well, I have separate reason to believe that a morally perfect being exists through like an ontological argument, and therefore I can just assume that there's good reason for it. But what's being done here in the problem of evil is an attempt to actually justify that suffering. So it, it would be more akin to somebody saying that they could justify hand sanitizer to my skin cells that they could do that, that they could speak to my hand, to, to my skin cells in such a way as to explain why I'm sanitizing them. Um, and I'm simply saying, or rather by analogy, the, the skin cells would be simply saying, like, what what on earth is that explanation? Um, and, and I find it wanting. I don't think we can know the mind of God. But if we can't know the mind of God, then I don't think we can say that evil is justified in the same respect that we can't say that it's not. All right, I'm going to kind of power through some of these questions because we have a lot to get through before we hit that two-hour mark. This one's from Paul Rimmer to Inspiring Philosophy. Michael, is everyone in heaven a vegan? <laughs> I mean, maybe everyone in heaven is a breatharian. I mean, in terms of the resurrection, I mean, we have to remember Christian heaven is the resurrection. Uh, I would say heaven is going to be far more, now this is probably a little bit of a caricature, but heaven is far more like Narnia in that kind of sense. There will be animals there. It's the resurrection in that sense that we're going to come back to earth in that sense. Are we going to be vegan? It's quite possible. I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the vegan arguments out there. I'm not going to deny it. Uh, and so I do think that is a p- strong possibility. I also think it's probably far more than we could fully ever imagine. Ultimately, though, what I say heaven is is the ultimate Christian goal is that it's kind of like a rebuttal to an atheist argument in that, oh, we're so small in this tiny universe. Why would, an in- why would this anyone care about us? Well, maybe it's we're small now, but I would say heaven if we're going to be resurrected back on the th- this earth and we're going to pick up where we left off in Eden – 
it's going to be our job to turn the whole universe into Eden in that sense. So tame the rash, env rash environments, finish up the job on this, this planet, and then move out to other planets, turn the whole universe into Eden. Very possible that the, the nature of that will be vegan in that sense, especially if we're supposed to help the soul building of other animals in that sense. I'm sure that if Jesus was vegan, he'd have let us know by now. Usually can't help themselves to tell people. Okay, so a question... <laughs> So a question from Roger Marshall. This one is for Alex. Alex, millions of people have been subjected to unspeakable evil with or without God. What hope can you offer these people without God that justice will be done or that this will that or that this evil will be addressed? Mm, it's an understatement. Millions. I mean, billions, 100 billion people have ever lived on this planet, which, by the way, is not far off. Or it's, it's just uh, slightly over the number of non-human land animals that are killed just for food alone every single year like the numbers that we're talking about are through the roof right that's not including sea life and that's not including wild animal suffering but the amount of suffering that's going on whether we're inflicting it or not is unbelievably large unbelievably large and the question is you know what can i offer these people without god well i don't know the answer to that question i could offer them i could offer them a it, different approaches are going to work with different people, right? And it, and it depends what you're trying to do here. Either I'm trying to offer them a genuine philosophical defense as to as to why they should be happy, or I'm just psychologically trying to make them feel better, right? If it seems like we're kind of implying that we're talking about the second, like what can we do to these people who are obviously going to be incredibly upset, incredibly hurt, and uh, it would depend on the person. You know, I can offer them a book. I, I mentioned Viktor Frankl. If you read Man's Search for Meaning, it's one of the most touching accounts of somebody managing to find meaning in the most meaningless of situations. Uh, and that might help somebody. But what I have to admit, uh, and, and you know, what I have to have the intellectual honesty to admit, is that if I don't have the answer to that question, and I don't think I do, that I, I, simply, I simply can't even pretend to have one. Right. So my, my job here is to show why I think evil and suffering in the world is so bad that we have reason to think that God wouldn't allow it. So if I don't even think that an omnipotent, omniscient being that was the creator of the universe could justify this kind of suffering, then I'm sure as hell that I couldn't either. And we may just have to accept the fact that there's nothing we can offer to these people. But if that's the case, then sad a reality as that may be, that reality is true of me and it's true of you and it's true of the Christian too. Because until we have a sufficient explanation, and I don't think God fulfills it, um, we, we're all in this boat together. We're all in this boat of suffering. And that's kind of the principal problem of philosophy when you're not religious. I think the most important problem of philosophy is what do we do about suffering? Because life necessitates suffering, which means that if there is any meaning to life, there is a meaning to suffering and death. And that's a difficult question to overcome. I have to simply admit that I can't overcome it, but that's not my job here today. Okay, this is another question for Alex. I think this is a question for Alex from Maverick Christian. Thank you for your super chat, Wade. He says, do you agree that without objective morality, there's no objective fact of the matter, whether God would adopt a standard of goodness, whereby it's good for God to permit suffering, and thus no objective fact whether God would allow it evil if he existed? Uh, I think maybe the question is kind of asking, if God is, does not exist and therefore perhaps there can't be objective morality, can the counterfactual still be true that if God did exist, he would be able to uh, justify evil or would, or would allow evil? Um, I think he's I, actually taking the, from the question. I think he's taking the perspective that uh, that Michael gave earlier where he was saying some, some Christians are nihilists. And so it doesn't seem to me like he's saying if there, if God does not exist. He's, he's, it seems to me he's asking a question about God's obligations yeah. if objective morality was did not exist. Oh, I see. Do you um, agree that without objective morality, there's no objective fact of the matter whether God would adopt a standard of goodness whereby it's good for him to permit suffering and thus okay, no well, objective that, fact whether God would allow evil? If that's the case, then I, then I fear that a confusion is being made that's made often, which is that um, the opposite of moral nihilism is moral objectivism, which is not true because moral subjectivism is not a form of moral nihilism, right? You can think that there are subjective truths about ethics. So if there were no objective morality um a christian could for instance think they could answer the you the euthyphro dilemma in the untraditional way of saying actually um or, or they, could, they could answer it they could answer it by saying that god determines what's good and evil and think that that kind of implies that god determines what's good and evil which means that it's subjective to him in other words good and evil are not subjective uh, are not objective they're subjective de de dependent on what god um 
commands, but that doesn't equal moral nihilism. That doesn't mean that they don't have force. That doesn't mean they're not true. It just means they're true with relation to a subject, um, like God. Um, but I, I still feel like I'm, I still feel like I'm misunderstanding the question here. Uh, I think he's just reiterating something in some opening statement that you you need you need good and evil to be objective for God to have any sort of bearing on for God to uh, stand in some of kind of relation, yeah, morally to these to these states of affairs. Uh, potentially, but I mean, look, my my view is that my partic- my views on morality are kind of notwithstanding for this debate. I'm I'm trying to attack the internal consistency of of Michael's views. So, if Michael thinks that morality is objective and there are objective wrongs and that there is a God, then it's his job to make them fit together and me to show how they don't. If Michael thinks that morality is subjective and there is a God, then he needs to show how that can work together. Um, so, like I. I, I don't I don't really I don't really know I, I'm I'm just kind of well let me so some Alex, of these, these worldviews has to be taken together right you have to you have to you have to know everything about what someone believes in order to kind of make the links between them so just knowing what they think about morality isn't really enough so let me give you a possible response that you could give here if you even mm-hmm. if you reject objective morality and even if yeah we're thinking about what God's obligations would be if moral realism was false and what you're saying is that we are looking at this from a consistency standpoint. So yeah. on the Christian worldview, God is loving, and so you could still say even if objective morality is not a thing, then God is still perfectly loving, and it would be consistent with a perfectly lo- loving nature to not allow suffering. Sure. Yeah. So the the question would kind of the the implication of that would be, um, as you say, let's not talk about good and evil because if they're not objective, maybe it's unhelpful. But if you think that God is all loving as a separate point then the question just reformulates itself. It's not just a question about like what's loving and what's not. It's like, we know facts about the universe. We know that children get cancer and we have to be committed to the view that that is loving, that it is loving to allow a, a child to get cancer. Um, it's the same problem as saying you have to accept that it is good or at least not evil for a child to get cancer. Um, it would just be like framed differently, right? Whatever the person believes, as you say, Cameron, that's probably the best way to answer it. With, with any argument I ever make on on any debate that I do, any video I make, it's always an argument of consistency, pretty much, most of the time. Um, and that, that's what I'm looking for here, is just, is just consistency. Make it work. Okay, let's uh, try to move on. We have so many Super Chats to get through. I don't think that we're going to be able to get to all of them today, so I really apologize about that if you've sent one in and we don't have time to get to it. Here's one from Alice Lawrence. She says, and this one is from Michael, if God is building virtuous souls for when they wake to eternal life, making the suffering a bad dream, does that not imply that people will need to overcome overcome suffering eternally? I think we will need to overcome the suffering we've experienced in this life. I don't think everyone dies ready to go to heaven. I agree with people like Jerry Walls that there is some sort of like purgatory state, not like Dante's comedy version, but some sort of state where people are still being sanctified and made virtuous. And there's a lot of evil that people are still overcoming in this life. I do think that we will need to continue to overcome that and ultimately, I don't think that there will be a lack of suffering in eternity. I think there's still going to be challenges that we will have. Challenge implies suffering. Although I do think that the soul building here will allow us to better deal with them in that sense. And that's why this uh, this aspect of our reality is very important in that sense. Okay, let's get to another question for Alex. This one is from Roni. Ronnie? Roni or Ronnie? Question for Alex. In Alex's worldview, where there is no suffering... Wouldn't that make us suicidal because we would not know when something is good and we wouldn't, we would not feel genuine happiness? You know, happiness and good when there is suffering. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in that question, but if we're considering suicide to be a bad thing, which in at least some and probably most cases it is a bad thing, uh, then it wouldn't make sense to characterize a world in which people are. Um, are committing suicide all the time as a world that is kind of good or optimal because the implication is kind of like if we get your optimal worldview here like your worldview alex if we get your optimal worldview wouldn't that lead people to kill themselves well no because if people were killing themselves and then it wouldn't be the optimal worldview like i've got no problem with allowing some evil and allowing some virtue maybe but what i'm saying is that the problem of evil as far as i can see it is an evidential one rather than a logical one it's about the 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 amount of suffering the level of suffering and the claim that we have the right amount of suffering in the world to justify the right amount of virtue um as as with the question earlier about evil where i where i just said look if if it wouldn't actually minimize evil then it then i I would simply say that that's the wrong thing to do uh 
I would consider suicide as one of the evils that needs to be taken into in, into the calculation. It's as simple as that. Like it's not a it's not so much a consequence of my worldview as as a uh, factor in the original analysis of which worldview I'd want to get in the conclusion. If that makes sense. Yeah, I I just wanted to to make a note. I just feel compelled to to say this. If you're battling anxiety or depression, and I, this is gonna kind of get serious for a moment, but if you're battling that thing, don't like just ignore it. Take action. Like do something about it. I think a lot of us in in this space in apologetics and in philosophy, a lot of us deal with some kind of like mental health issues I- issue. And so take it seriously. If you're battling with anxiety or, or depression, go see a professional expert, like a psychiatrist, someone who's an expert in brain chemistry. See if there's something going on that you can either work out through cognitive behavioral therapy or with medication. But don't just sit on it. Don't just like let it fester because there are options out there. If you need to just call someone, talk to somebody please take care of it immediately i just i felt like i needed to say that okay so Probably. from and, and also don't don't over philosophize it at the beginning right yeah. but f- philosophizing about suffering um and certainly philosophizing about suicide is an incredible luxury that we have to be able to do in a position of kind of rational inquiry rather than as a matter of um personal yeah, right. investigation this isn't yeah, the place don't be a to... philosophizer yeah hey do you guys have time to go a little bit long today just to answer some more questions or What's what's the status? It should be fine by me, as long as you don't keep yeah, it forever. Yeah, sure. Let's just probably have a cutoff point at some point, because I don't want people to just think that three more hours of Super Chats. And- yeah, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, so, okay, let's just get through uh, a few more here, and then we'll we'll move to some closings. Okay, uh, this one is... Uh, I'm not going to... Dr- so some of the Super Chats that are being sent in seem a little bit tangential and not related, so I'm, gonna, I'm unfortunately going to have to skip over some of these. Joshua Heal or hell, says, if God is omnipotent, is he bound to the rules of logic? What implications will this have on things like free will and the need for suffering in order to derive well-being? Both respond, please. So let's start with so you, you, Michael, yeah. Yeah, so if you want to see a full, a, a bigger explanation, see my video, The Omnipotence Paradox Debunked. Uh, one thing you have to realize is logic is not some sort of set of boundaries. Logic is descriptive. It describes the way things are. So logic essentially, in a metaphysical sense, would be it simply describes everything that is and everything that is possible. So God is not bound to the rules of logic in that sense. If something is outside of logic, it's just non-existent. Yeah, I, I would actually, I would simply tend to agree. Um, in the past, I've made videos where I've tried to use the omnipotence paradox. I think I used it in my first ontological argument video. Um, I would retract that. I'm hoping to put out a video at some point in the future about things I've variously got wrong in, in videos, and that will be one of the first things. My understanding of omnipotence has changed such that to be omnipotent is to be able to do all things, not to be able to do anything, but to be able to do all things. A friend of mine always puts it like, um, he, he says that omnipotence is the ability to do all things, and that logical contradictions simply aren't things. They don't exist. Like the square, the, the squared triangle doesn't exist. It's not a thing. So you can do all things whilst not being able to square the circle. Okay, so here's a question for Alex from Gil Cancel Comus. Comus. Question for Alex. How does this reasoning apply to parenthood? Is a parent who allows anything that their child would consider suffering, vaccination, school, make it unlikely that they are a good parent? Does it lead to better adults? Uh, No, but remember, the parent isn't in a position to remove that kind of suffering. If, 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 If a parent had the opportunity to make their children such that they didn't need vaccinations, they'd do it, right? Um, I made a video on the problem of evil a while ago in response to what do you mean, um, who gave the example of dentistry. He kind of talked about a a parent taking their child to the dentist, and although it would cause suffering for the child, um, and the child wouldn't even understand, this is the real part of the analogy, is that you couldn't explain to the child why they need to undergo the suffering, but you know that it's better for them. Yeah, but if you were in a position where you could make it such that they didn't need to go to the dentist, that they didn't have toothache in the first place, you prefer that. Um, but a parent isn't in that position. So when a parent is in a situation where suffering is necessitated, then yeah, make sure you do everything your kid can do to get over that. Get them vaccinated, get them through school, all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you had the opportunity to make it such that they didn't have to go through that suffering, I think any parent in their right mind would do so. Okay, here's a question for Michael. That's actually a good segue here. So he says, Michael, what about the person who suffers their whole life but then isn't saved? So I think this is a question about the point that you were making about afterlife and heaven. Yeah, I would remind people that in this view, everybody gets what they want in the end. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell, to quote C.S. Lewis. And basically the point is that, uh, as I said earlier, God will let anyone into heaven who will stomach it. So 
hell is just simply a freely chosen identity built on something else besides God going on forever. God wants everyone in eternity with him, but heaven is just being with God. Hell is rejecting God. If you don't want to be with God, you get that in the end. So he warns that will not be good for you ultimately because it could lead to the destruction of your soul. But if, if you think you know better, you have every right to do that. All right, this one appears to be another question for Michael from Phil. If omniscience is a requirement to be God and God created the world knowing all that would happen prior to creating it, doesn't this disprove free will? Yeah, this is easy to address. You can also see my video on the omniscience paradox. Uh, no, because for, uh, omniscience isn't determining. It doesn't imply fatalism. You could think of God more as like the infall infallible weather barometer. It doesn't cause the weather, but it can always predict the weather. So God's, uh, our actions determine what God knows. He does our, His knowledge does not determine our actions in that sense. An analogy could be set up like this. If I had a time machine, I go into the future and I watch everything you do tomorrow, and then I come back to today, and so I know everything's going to happen, does that mean I determined you? No, because knowledge doesn't determine. Okay, so this is another very sensitive question, and I want to make sure we, we handle this with care. Joshua Anderson asked, question for Alex, if a person truly has nothing to live for, then can suicide be the right path? Um, well, I, as you say, we have to be very careful here and recognize that we're talking about this in a philosophical context. And I talk about this topic a lot, and I write about this topic a lot. Um, I speak about it with friends, and I have the liberty of just saying what I think without having to be careful. I've never addressed it in public before because it's it's a bit of a responsibility. I've been meaning to make a video about whether death is bad for the person who dies, but I realize it's probably a bad time to do that with the pandemic and everything. Um, but the philosophy, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you can't imagine a situation in which it's rational for someone to commit suicide, then you simply aren't trying hard enough. Um, there are definitely situations in which somebody can determine that their life would be better not to continue and be correct about that. The problem is that most people who think that are probably wrong, in my view, or in the estimation of most people, let's say, at the very least. Um, some people will try to address the problem by saying, never give up, there's never a reason to end your life. Um, but I think that that's not only untrue, but also unhelpful, because to the person who feels as though they want to end their life, that can invalidate their opinion. If you say, by definition, you have to be wrong, because life is always worth living, it's always worth never giving up, you just immediately invalidate their position, and they think, well, you, you're not listening to me, you don't understand how much pain I'm feeling. Whereas if we approach the problem by saying, yes, yeah, there are situations in which it's better to kill yourself, so now let's work together and see if you're in that situation, then they feel like you're listening to them, and you can have an actual constructive conversation, and you can lead them on a road that says, actually, no, you're not in that situation, and here's why. But if you begin the conversation by just saying, no, it's never, it's, it's, it's never a good idea to, to commit suicide, then that person is going to shut themselves off from you, and you are also incorrect, because there are such situations. Approach the issue seriously, as if they're asking you a serious philosophical question, which they are. Um, should I kill myself? And you have to say, I don't know. Let's work it out together. And the answer is probably going to be no. But it's not no by default. Michael, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, this is difficult because I know I've been there before where due to depression I've, I've felt suicidal in the past. Uh, the, the question is is what people would say, you know, do I have anything to live for? And it's like, well, of course you have things to live for. Um, then you may feel like that, but just take a step back and just recognize what's going on in this situation. Don't Think irrationally from the limited knowledge you have now. Recognize what's sort of happening here. Depression is multidimensional. There are physical aspects. Sometimes people just need prop. They need a good night's sleep. They need a good meal. They need medication. Uh, sometimes there are emotional things, and they need that needs to be addressed. I did a video on my channel last summer called "Depression on Depression," and I cover this pretty extensively. So if you want more, please please watch that because I hope it would help. But when it comes to suicide, I would say that. Your intri the intrinsic goodness of your life is always going to be far better than whatever sort of suffering or pain you're going through. And recognize that, that all of that suffering will one day be turned into an ultimate joy. Uh, and that just because it may you may not see the light at the end of the tunnel now, that doesn't mean it will come. And I do think it will come. This is what we are promised in the, in the Gospels, and I have no reason for denying that. So on the Christian worldview, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel, and everything will come together as it is promised. Okay, let's turn to another question from, and I think this is going to be our last one before we do some closings, from Motion Khan. He says, if I die and go to hell, ultimate suffering, 
God already knew this before creating me, yet he went on to create me. Doesn't this imply that he can't be merciful knowing what he knew? So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I think we have to go back to what we mean by good and evil. Is suffering ultimately going to outshine the, uh, the suffering of the individual in that sense? And my argument, uh, going back on some of the earlier analogies I gave, is the goodness of life is always intrinsically better than any sort of intrinsic badness there is in suffering. Also, I don't think hell is necessarily eternal. I would call myself more of an eventual annihilation, an annihilationist, in that God exiles people from his presence, and then they slowly uh, would go out of existence of their own accord. So I don't think that it's sort of this eternal, endless, horrible place that people are, are stuck in. I think, although the, ultimately the intrinsic goodness of the life itself is always going to be better than that. And ultimately, I also re remind people that everyone in the end will get what they want. You can be in heaven if you want. I don't believe that. Uh, I'm, I'm also not an advocate that once you're in hell, there's no chance for postmortem salvation. So there's always that opportunity to turn around and get out. Anything to, to add, Alex? Sorry, I, to closings. Uh, I I didn't I didn't quite catch that. Did you say that if someone's in hell, they do or they don't have the opportunity to move from hell into heaven? I do think they have the opportunity to move into heaven, but I okay. think it's exceptionally rare. Right. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I would have had a point if you went if you went the other way, but I, I'm I'm happy to just kind of move on for the sake of time. I, well, I mean, yeah. No. Yeah. I haven't really got much of meaning to say on that topic. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's move into, uh, so I wanted to mention to everybody, so what we're doing right now with our channel is we're planning a conference. And so I just wanted to let you know that in the fall of 2021, we're planning a Capturing Christianity, the first ever Capturing Christianity conference. And the way that this is even possible is that we're looking to bring my wife, who is a, an ex like, she is the most gifted event planner in the world. And I'm not just saying that she really is gifted. And so we're looking to bring her on board with capturing Christianity full time as soon as possible. So we just launched a, a campaign to make this happen. And if you want to help, you can go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. The link to this is in the description of the video and you can help make this conference and other conferences and a lot of other really cool things that we have planned going on uh, happen. If you help support the ministry on Patreon. With that said, let's go to some closing. So with Inspiring Philosophy, let me get my clock here down to, uh, would you like to stick with two minutes or do you want to move it up to, to three or, or how would you like to, to do these? Whatever Alex wants is fine with me. What um, do you think, I'm, Alex? I'm good. I'm good with two minutes. I, I, I don't exactly have like a planned thing. So I was just going to kind of fill the time with um, with general observations. So Feel free. two minutes is fine. Okay. All right. So whenever you're ready, Michael, I'll start the timer. So I think Alex took the words right out of my mouth when he pointed out the argument from evil is really an attack on internal internal consistency. The only problem is, is then they def they def they they define what is good and evil in terms of what how they would define it, and not in terms of how the biblical worldview would define it. So it really isn't an attack on inter internal consistency. We have to be careful about what we mean by good and what we mean by evil. We can't assume a utilitarian understanding of this and then use that to attack the Christian worldview. Uh, I, I think ultimately, though, a lot of the uh, arguments from evil start, tend to just sort of collapse this idea as like, but look at all that suffering. Why would a good God allow this? It, uh, sadly, they just reduce to these appeals to emotion, and then they ignore the overall picture of the Christian worldview, namely the afterlife, the dreamlike nature of this reality. Alex was pressing me on something earlier about like, would I want my daughter to be given a horrible disease if um, – if he was some sort of time traveler. And I was saying no, because I'm emotionally invested, obviously. But let's say we were living in Inception, and we were in a dream layer world. And I knew this was a dream layer world. And I knew that at any moment, my daughter could just wake up and she'd be back in this world and be fine. I That might that would entirely change the circumstances. And from God's perspective, that's how this world operates, is that everyone sort of gets out and they have the ability to grow in an eternal setting with God in a more real and fundamental reality. He also brought up the dentist example where he replied to, what do you mean with John McRae? And, you know, that's a good point. But also, if you remember, it's not about that. The dentist example is about physical pain, whereas God is more focused on virtuous building and mental suffering and what and how that that can be instrumentally good in sort of building these souls in that sense. And that may not be able to be removed if you're going to work with free creatures unless God is sort of determining us. And if you get to that sense, it just goes back to my other example. It just takes you back into the world of the Stepford Wives. Where it doesn't matter if we grow in knowledge by understanding science. It doesn't matter if we grow in virtues. It's all about just pleasure. Who cares about evil? No evil, no virtue. Stepford Wives is a far better world, and I don't think that's intrinsically true at all. Okay, and let's move to a two-minute closing. 
We'll pull up my count down here and get you queued up. So whenever you're ready, I'll start the timer. Sure. Uh, well, there's there's nothing that can be said in the final two minutes that hasn't already been said, but I can just kind of, I suppose there's one clarification that could be made, which is we haven't really talked much about this emotional, rational distinction. Um, it may appear with a lot of the things that I say or have said that I'm making an appeal to an emotion, which is not true in the logically fallacious sense, but is true in a in an important sense. Um, for example, you know, in the past I've discussed abortion or something and, and, and said like, the the truth of a matter shouldn't be determined about how we feel about the conclusion and people have said to me that you can't say that you know don't be emotional about a subject like abortion like it's so important to take into consideration the emotions and this is the key point right the fallacious appeal to an emotion is to say that you don't like the conclusion therefore the conclusion's wrong because you've got some emotional reaction to the conclusion yeah sure that's wrong but what's not wrong to do is to consider people's emotions as part of the analysis, right? Consider people's emotions as part of the consequence of the action and determine whether or not it's, it's right or wrong, taking them into account, right? That's a different thing from analyzing the emotional reaction we have to the conclusion. Um, so in the problem of evil, when it seems like we're talking emotively, when we, when we say like there are innocent people dying, it may seem as though that's an appeal to emotion. I'm just trying to get people to feel bad. It's like, no, it's a philosophical point. It's that these people are innocent, meaning that they... Uh, you know, prima facie don't have a reason uh, that's deserving of the punishment inflicted upon them um, and they're going to suffer emotionally for it to this extent and this extent and you can talk about the the emotional impact um, that is actually rationally relevant because the argument has to be that that emotional suffering is justified so you do have to bring up the emotions the emotional uh, context and I, I, Michael wasn't denying that you do but I just wanted to make clear that an appeal to emotion can either mean the fallacious sense of saying that you don't like the conclusion, you have a strong emotional reaction to the conclusion, that's fallacious. But to incorporate emotions into an argument that you're making, to incorporate how people will feel in determining whether or not you should commit an action is, is an appeal to emotion in a different sense that's definitely not fallacious. All right. Well, thank you guys both for coming on to Capturing Christianity for this debate. We've been talking about this for a long time. So I'm glad that we were actually able to, to make it happen. What were your thoughts? How, how do you think the, the debate went? Do, do you have any thoughts on like the format? Was did, did you enjoy it? I just want to say I think it's this has all been an intervention to get Alex to read Lord of the Rings. This has all been a ploy. We know it all along, and you better read it because we're very disappointed in you. I, for a moment, I thought you were going to say some other kind of intervention was happening now, and I got a bit worried. Um, <laughs> I thought this. I thought this was good. I, I the format. Why I, I prefer this format. I think I've done a few debates recently where there's been uh, a discussion period, which I initially suggested for this debate. But after I had those debates, and the discussion period fell into just absolute chaos, and just I, I know. just <laughs> I like, sell some of it, yeah. begin to explain. And I, I'm sure the same wouldn't have happened with us, <laughs> Michael. But even even thinking about our last debate that we had on morality. This feel it's got more structure. You can identify what the points are and you can pull them out and analyze them. So I, I enjoyed it. The only problem was that because you've got a timer ticking, whereas usually if I'm making a point trying to you know respond to something you've said, I'd have said, now, look, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying that. So it may appear at times that I was being a bit um, forthright, let's say. Uh, but or too that's quick. The of, of, of the timing, yeah. Um, that's, the only, that's the only downside. But I hope people don't interpret when I say, no, this is wrong and here's why me being rude believe me if i had more time i'd probably be a bit more um i'd have a bit more decorum um proper propriety let's say uh but that's just a result of the format but i think it was really good so as i've said i have both of these guys linked in the description of the video so if you want to check out ip inspiring philosophy or if you want to check out cosmic skeptic alex o'connor check out their channels linked in the description of the video thank you for tuning in today and let me just talk to the audience real quick if you've been enjoying the content again patreon.com slash caption christianity is the way to support the ministry we have some really cool things coming up the conference is a big thing we already we just locked in uh, as of yesterday our third sponsor so this thing is already starting to take take off it's it's amazing it's it's incredible if you want to help the if you want to help this project and help future projects, capturing pa patreon.com slash capturing Christianity is the way to do it. So thank you guys for tuning in today and we'll see you later.